Five, four, three, two, one. Welcome, welcome to the first um to the first mega stream. Today we have a very special stream. I have hold on, I have a this running somewhere else and it's driving me crazy. Oh, there, found it. Sorry. Sorry for that. Now, first mega stream we have. The pre-show, the debate, which will be a watch party here with me, and the after show. How are you doing, Oz? Are you ready? Oh yeah, I'm. I'm doing well. I just uh, finally got another debate lined up. Um, it's my second debate, besides doing it on the Modern Day Debate Discord, um, or my own channel. <laughs> so, <laughs> it, and I'm doing it on journalism again. But Jaren seems to be a pretty good moderator at least for the youtube so it'll be yeah. the same format as last time i did with uh craig but 1v1 on um, this time that is awesome do you have any any strategies planned or just winging it um i mean i got the video i made that 30 minute video so i just plan on playing that and walking away because i got 30 minutes <laughs> and um i'll let that do my debating and then i'll go eat dinner and whatever and come <laughs> back later and no 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 I, I i think it'll be fine um we'll see how it goes i i, I need to take notes hey billy all right we have billy and if you want to join the stage right there i finally got it that it's this hand that i need to use to point to the side chat so Finally made that brain connection. I'm not going to mess it up and go like this. So yeah, there, pin to the top of the side chat. You can come join us on stage. And we're going to have the pre-show, the, the the debate, which will be a watch party. We're not going to subject you to the toxicity of uh, Jaren's uh, live chat. So we can all hang out here and wait for us to come back. And we can do the motions of the after show. Ashton, please, can we, can we drop the, the jokes? But it's not it's not really comfortable for me that, that you're making those here. This is not the ethos of the channel. So Billy, how are you? Have you seen uh Shane ever debate? Uh I haven't seen him debate, but uh I've seen him in that uh one Discord that I listened to, the Earth Awakenings Discord. Uh -huh. He's in there a lot. Uh basically, yeah, uh, I think. Like the Faraday cage just kills this, uh, so that's pretty much all I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we'll see what happens. Um, I remember bringing that up with Witsit, and the his only objection was that the Faraday cage wasn't perfect. I guess <laughs> so... that's maybe. I, well, yeah, if it's not done properly, maybe yeah. Well, but even if it wasn't perfect, you would at least see a reduction in the magnitude if, if if even if we were to grant you but Oz has some other special stuff prepared for this debate so I'm really excited for this one uh the whole electrostatics uh being gravity idea is is quite nonsensical to most of us and uh Oz has an, a one video which I'm going to share the link with everyone here so that you can reference it, but not now, later. Today we have a long stretch of programming for you, so you can save the link for later. Yeah, they uh, could say that I straw man their electrostatics is gravity, but how, oh yeah, 39 more days until the um, rapture, forgot. Yes. Yeah, 39 more days, Oh, May I have, 19th. I have something planned for that uh, for that counter, so I'll, I'll, okay. I'll put that up in just a moment but they um to to get around a lot of these concepts they'll deny that light can be quantized and so i i imagine we'll get into a lot of these type of concepts and stuff like that um and then they deny the cavendish experiment and they say there's no you know how what did it measure and or anyways all these type of claims and stuff like that i'm prepared, prepared. for all those type of questions so Hell yeah. um it's very, very simple that it's it's not advanced concepts, that it's very commonsensical sort of observations. We can all verify that mass does indeed 
attract mass. And um, if they want to reify it something else, it's really on them to try to do that. And uh, that would be a reification fallacy. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, what what do you think is going to happen as the only panel member right now today, really? Well, at least this time we have somebody not denying gravity exists. Uh, they at least acknowledge that there's some force that is uh, causing this gravity. So at least there's that. But there, that like I don't, I don't think he believes in space though, too. So I don't know. Yeah. Ah. The, the old problem of holding uh, weird positions is that you you get into some some stuff that might not make a lot of sense to the rest of the, of people I I have uh, I have a lot and of faith in you and also, there's, right? yeah there's no reason to deny space if they believe there's an atmospheric downward acceleration for a container like like, why do you deny space? And no one denies an atmosphere exists and a pressure gradient exists. You just think it's some electrostatic gradient. <clears throat> I mean, we just say on the Van Allen belt captures most of that ionized radiation. Some of it gets through and some of it's through the normal weather cycle. The particles go up and it creates electrostatic charges as it brings up. It's all explained in that lecture that Feynman presented like, oh, 90 years ago now, right? Long time ago. Mm -hmm. Oh, it wasn't 90 years ago. I, it, you would think it was 50s. I'm trying to, I might do this for one second. I'm trying to, I set up a virtual camera, but it's not letting me use two cameras at the same time. 1957. Which is weird. No. Ah, uh, hold on. Uh, while I fix that, uh, if you're in the audience, thank you for being here. We uh, are counting down the days to the rapture. We're on 39 to go until we do the world didn't end stream. <laughs> and uh, yesterday, you look to be having a lot of fun with. Uh, the the eclipse and, and that um tell us anything you want to tell us about uh, that experience anything you want to tell us about uh, when we're going to get the video and stuff yeah i still haven't um downloaded them from my things i've been preparing for my debate today so um i plan on working on that stuff the rest of the week um and we'll see what i can do um with that and i'll let you all know you'll see it uh, when I get it posted, I, I basically probably will be posting this video I just made for uh, the Feynman lecture stuff and talking about um, the Cavendish experiment. I think I, I removed all the um, noise and static from the lecture. So anyways, I, I could probably do that for all the lectures of his stuff and fix it and add notes and stuff to make them more like modern. You guys remember this stuff is like 70 years old. Hey, Brenda. What's up, Brenda? Oh, we lost Max too. We're, we're going to do a watch party here today. So we're not going to make people go to the chat over at Jaren's channel. Uh, good, good afternoon. How you doing? Um, kind of a lazy day for me. Yeah, I was sort of busy preparing for my debate. I mean, I've been preparing for this ether stuff, I guess, for a while, but, um, but just formalizing it for what the topic actually is, because Shane wasn't like agreeing to a specific topic on ether cosmology. But it looks like we, we narrowed it down to basically what gravity is. And um, we might get into gravity and um, electrostatics, ether was the other one, and yeah. like the eclipse and stuff like that. So so what what's your approach with because I think I think Shane is a poet. Yeah. 
I think mm -hmm. that because um, I remember him talking with um, with Toon, and it just seemed to me that um, I, it, it seems to me that there, there's some people that join in with Flat Earth because it's their opportunity to get some recognition and have some socialization, and they're willing to say these things in order to get that reward. And so I think I think he's going to be very cagey. It's going to be very unlike somebody who he's not a true believer, I don't think. Uh -huh. And so I'm just asking, how do you approach somebody that you think is is somebody like that? If that's what you think, because, you know, obviously I could be wrong. It's always a possibility. Um, I want to just hold to very humble um, observations that are easy to confirm, um, like Cavendish experiment and stuff like that, and um, ask for the same type of um, responses from him for his own worldview. And sort of like, you know, I, I, I don't know what else to do. I, I sort of just have to take him at his word when it comes to the debate like if he's just gonna if he's just playing the devil's advocate that's people do that anyways um i had a twitter conversation with them that sort of implied that to me that same thing where like he will just make up whatever will explain what he wants it to explain that but he, it, I do think he believes the earth is flat, but I don't think he cares as much about what the explanation is. It's more, you, you, are you familiar with Neo that comes on sometimes? Neo yes. fight? No, yeah. I'm not, I don't recall. Yeah, he does this all the time where he reifies concepts like, oh, it has the appearance of glass, like the Van Allen belts, like to the ionized um, particles. So he calls it glass. I'm like, that's, no, they're not calling it glass. He said appearance of. They mean that like it, it has the same type of effects to these things as glass would to these other things. This is an analogy. It's not the same thing. <laughs> but um, so he'll take the analogy and run with it as if it's like hidden language. And maybe, maybe he actually believes the earth is flat, but He's playing a game with the rest of the stuff, if you know what I mean, um, like the ether cosmology. And I'm not sure how much they believe actually in ether cosmology. I get the sense that wits it, based on some other stuff of his that I watched, that he is a true believer in ether cosmology. Um, but I'm not sure about everybody. Yeah. Well, I think definitely what has happened, what is true with Shane is he's is definitely seen that his reputation has been rising in among those there's sort of those flat earthers who believe in the electric in, in electric replacement of gravity, right? Mm -hmm. And there, there's others that don't. But among those that believe in a, in what the electric electromagnetic as an explanation yeah. for gravity he's definitely achieved some kind of recognition among those um, oh, oh, <clears throat> um yeah no. so what is your general what's your you are you what is the general topic and and i i think that the hard thing is going to be um keeping on topic because the last thing yeah. like uh, as usual the last thing flat earthers want to do is talk about their theory they want to talk about your theory it's supposed to be gravity and mass um versus electrostatics okay. so it's supposed to be on topic of what explains why things fall down um which i'm sure we'll get into ether the concept of ether overall like um, light propagation and, you know, if we get into it, I got stuff to cover, like is light a wave or a particle? And I'm even going to use other flat earthers to um, like show that not all flat earthers even agree with this concept. Like light is a is considered to be both. So there's no reason to treat light as uh, as if it needs to 
be a wave that needs a medium to tra to um, travel through because it is also like a particle. So and or you could treat the vacuum of space like an ether, like some people have proposed in the past. So there's no reason, and the ether doesn't falsify space. And if and appealing to electrostatics, like okay, it's gravity. Then you got a pressure gradient. There's no reason to deny space in the that we're next to a vacuum, right? It's like I I don't know like. With that, in, in regard to stuff like that, I'm just going to appeal to mass attracts math. I'm going to ask how light propagates, how we can know one-way speed of light versus the motions of the Earth and how we can distinguish between the two because um, there is no way to know if uh, we have a fixed lab, right? Absolute um, lab frame that's non-moving. Um, it may be actually impossible to to have a fixed lab to measure the speed of light, right? Um, I, I think it, it is impossible. Um, like fit, like um, philosophically impossible. So you you would never be able to tell the difference between is it ether wind or is it the motion of the Earth. Um, so to to pick between one or the other would just be based on their preference. And we have so much other reason to believe that it's not either win. So like I, I plan on approaching it more as a philosophical question. Cause me, to me it is, Hey, Mark Reed. Yeah. We're going to have a debate on Jaronism's channel. Uh, me and Shane. So you can come up on stage. We're going to do a watch party here. Um, so you don't have to go to their chat unless you want to go to their chat, talk to their chat. <laughs> <But>. <laughs> Yeah, uh, one of the reasons why uh, flat earthers reject gravity in the first place is because it sort of necessitates believing that the earth is a globe because of gravity should pull everything together. And if they yeah. their replacement works the same way, it just leads to the same undesirable result, which yeah. was the original reason for rejecting gravity anyway. Yeah, if they're saying electrostatics pulls everything together, then it should form the shape of a sphere. Like, I don't, like, I don't know, like, what they're debating. But it, that's that's the concepts I, I plan on discussing if we get into those type of weeds. It's going to be that 45-minute uh, timed, so we both have 45 minutes, so it could be a little frustrating with that. I need to, oh, that's what I was going to do, though, is make, um... Douglas Jenkins said, he, he matters now. Uh, so for those of you who are just joining in, we're going to have the watch party here. So we have our countdown, 39 days to the rapture, and uh, we'll watch the the part, the, the debate here. Uh, I still, I'm still thinking how we're going to go about it because I don't want to... Uh, pause it and I, I think I'll just let the debate run and we can discuss it in the, the side chat and I can bring the comments up uh, so we don't miss anything of, of what's being said. Uh, but if you have any questions uh, or anything, make sure to tag either me or Maris now and we'll make sure to put up those on screen while the debate happens. Uh, Mark Reed says, good luck, Oz. Not that you will really need it. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Thank you for being here. Thanks, you have Mark. a stream coming up, so hopefully that goes well, too. You have a, a room rumble, I think I saw. So, ah, one, our good friend Tyler. I'm just joining in. Hello, all. Hello, Tyler. Hope you're having a, an awesome day. Uh, I, I already asked Billy. Uh, Brenda, do you have any, any predictions for the outcome of the debate? Do you have any idea of what's going to happen? I don't think I know Shane well enough. I think he's going to, uh, his best strategy is to avoid answering questions at all costs. So I, that's going to be, his, that's going to be the main problem. I think he's just going to avoid being specific. He's going to want to be general and, in, and never be, never get nailed down on any specific thing. 
well, fair enough. That's, uh, do we know? Of, do we know of many people that were raptured during the eclipse? Uh no. Well, Darn if it. if they were, God could have just wiped our memories of their existence. True. That is true. Yeah. Makes it unfalsifiable. But the ones who were preaching there are still around. Ah. Or I banned them. Or I, I freeze the sword. Uh, Creaky Blinder made a video of like the craziest things that he saw on TikTok about the eclipse. And uh, another show I watch on YouTube said that some people were going around churches leaving uh, clothes like laying down, uh -huh. sort of like the people disappear. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. that's pretty funny. That's funny. Well, I think that's kind of, uh, I, I don't know a, a lot about it, but I would imagine the psychology of uh, these kind of oh. apocaly apocalyptic beliefs. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on one Sorry. second. We have Caleb, Caleb in, the, in the audience. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's funny that you're mocking someone for something that you don't even know what that's all about. So, like, stay in your corner, buddy. I take medicine for it too, but you know, hey. I, I was gonna At say least he has a soul. Yeah, huh? I, 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 <laughs> I believe the psychology of apocalyptic beliefs like this is is one is that they kind of like laying out clothes. It, it's kind of like, um, if I do this, it kind of, maybe it will become true kind of a thing. Like um, if I do these kinds of things like laying out, pretending that, that it's real or trying faking how it's real, my, whatever my apoc apocalyptic belief is, then this somehow helps it it helps uh, Jesus to return or something like that. I don't know if you give much credence to that or not. Maybe. So they think like preaching the rapture helps to bring it closer? Is that? Well, if I fake the rapture, like if I fake laying up clothes of people who've been raptured, that somehow relieves, it might, it might in my in my view, kind of also kind of be kind of a relief of anxiety about it not coming true, about being yeah. wrong. You know, I, I don't I, know, I'm I just don't, guessing. It's just, I think it was just a joke of people. That, that's something like someone like me would do just to mess with them. It's funny, it's a, it's a good joke. I wouldn't do that, but yeah, I, I get the joke though. I, I don't like picking on people for their religious beliefs. You know me, like, or even the lack of them. Even though no. I do get on atheist probably the most, and I should stop doing that. But uh, um, I, I just hate getting told I can't, like, believe that God doesn't exist by other atheists. But, but, but when, when it, Go ahead. When it comes to humor, I believe that if the joke is funny, you are allowed yeah. to say it. Yeah, no, sure. And but it, it's not even like a prank or something. It's just a, I don't know. I, I my idea of humor is extremely weird, so I get that I might be in the wrong here. But I don't think you're in the wrong. <laughs> Hopefully, I get a message or an email or something soon. I like to be early, you know. Yes, me too. But the last well, there, time it was pretty late. <laughs> there was a notice that came up on Telegram just a minute ago. Oh, okay. From Jaron. You're part of his group on Telegram. You're crazy. Well, that Brandon. seems to be the only. Um, he is so paranoid. He he will not use email. Jaron does not use email because he's so paranoid. And, and that seems I'm... to be what happens with a lot of these with these people is they they get they get so paranoid about um, internet social medias. And being spied on and stuff. <laughs> so he thinks the government can't watch him on Telegram? I, I don't understand. No, well, but it's the Russian government, so it's okay. Yeah, the Russians are watching <laughs> him. So they'll just give it to the U.S. then. Uh, supposedly, because it's a world government that they believe in, right? Yeah. 
Uh, it's funny. Uh, I I don't use Telegram that much anymore. I used to use it when I was doing uh, buying drugs, basically. But now I don't use it anymore. I just use regular apps because I don't care. I, I don't really recommend um, Jaren's, Jaren's debatism telegram is just filled with um, Nazi propaganda. I mean, um, those those people, they're free to post stuff there, and it's it's pretty bad. Uh, yeah. Shifty, Shifty Eye Shady asks you, uh, Brenda, well, they use other social media. Are you sure that's a reason? He told me he doesn't like to oh, no. you he likes to use Facebook and Telegram. He doesn't like to use email. That's what Jaron told me. But I don't I don't like using Facebook. But like I don't know. Just I gave him my email address and Shane has my info, so somebody will send it to me. Oh, because they do it over Zoom, right? Yeah, they use Zoom. Um, I, I don't think the reasons are involved. I think it's it's just a levels of 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 fear, being afraid, being being worried about being, because for a lot of flat earthers, they're also very conspiratorial, and they're. I don't. I've lost track of how many times I've been told that that I am. Uh, CIA or FBI oh. or something like that. I I really really they really do. It happens a lot. What's your what's your number? Double or what? I no numbers. I, I'm numberless. I, I'm numbers nameless. I, I, I'm nameless. I'm nameless. What what do you guys think my search history is like? Uh. Like all this stuff I do, all I do is this. Like shit. Oh, yeah, life, physics. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, the, the bait starts at um in thirty minutes. Twenty um, minutes. Yes. and we're going to have the watch party right here. So hang around. We'll watch the debate all together, and then we'll have the after show. It's a mega stream we're doing today, counting down to the rapture right here. Thirty nine days. Definitely. Yeah, I've definitely had the experience where like. I will join a Discord um, voice channel, and simply by coincidence, somebody else, another Glober that's there, will have left either momentarily or almost as soon as I get there. Somebody that I don't know at all, or don't only know through social media and have no real, real connections to, and the fact that one leaves and that I come, they freak out. They, they really think that, oh, there was a shift change, right? You guys change shifts. And then they're not joking, <laughs> you know. They, 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 really, they really are um, very, very frightened people. I put a banner on the bottom so people can see it. Yay. What oh, it doesn't get rid of our names. Oh, I think I fixed that with the button. Awesome. Yeah, they've been putting uh, a lot of new features. Uh, welcome, Al, Al Tracker. Wow, I can't believe they're still arguing. Who are you talking about? But All welcome. Right. So uh, we we've all given our our ideas. Now we're just on the on the point of the after of the pre-show that we start like waiting. So we can ramble about whatever we have on our minds. Brenda, did you get to watch the uh, eclipse yesterday? Um, I did not. Um, the weather, it was drizzly and rainy and overcast here. I mean, oh. I noticed I noticed a decrease in, in sort of illumination, but mm -hmm. I mean, it was just solid co cloud cover here. Oh, so that's I didn't too see bad. anything. So if we, if you were a flat earther, right now you would be saying that the eclipse didn't happen because you didn't see it. <laughs> well, I, I just can't, I just can't understand how um, something that how it can we can know that it, we can't know that it's the moon because you can't see anything, right? Oh, it must, oh, there must be magic. There, there must be magic because 
there's nothing in the sky as but the sun. You can't see it. And then all of a sudden it gets covered up. It must be, it must be, what is it? What is the ones they say? Keto, Keto, or those? Um, uh, what's it called? Nibiru? The black sun. Nibiru. There's a black sun that's, that uh, hides or something like that. I've heard them say that, one of them. Yeah. So, but, 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 <laughs> is there a black, is there a black sun or moon there all the time? Like, explain it's this hiding. to me. It's hiding. Well, and is it a circle? Because the moon isn't like a, occluded by a circle. Uh, did any of you get to watch the, there was a video that came up of the eclipse from the ISS, like the, the shadow yeah. on the air. That was a pretty cool video. I saw that. That was an amazing shot. But there's people yeah. complaining, why didn't NASA just drive over to where and, and get a shot from right <laughs> underneath the yeah, yeah, they can just do that, right? Yeah. I told them why don't they just spend the money themselves to to do it? So like <laughs> Isn't the moon supposed to be transparent according to Flat Earth? Yep. Yep. Yeah. So then how how does it how does an eclipse like happen? They, it's yeah, not exactly. a welcome, moon. Welcome to Flat Earth. Earth. It's a higher dimensional being or something like that. Absolutely. Yeah. Welcome just, welcome to Flat Earth, Tyler. Welcome to Flat Earth. Absurdity after absurdity. Like their their model has absolutely no consistency. It's just, it I, I want an explanation for this. Oh. Look and look, there's a sunset all around us. Look, there's yes. a sunset. All around us, all around us, there's a sunset. Oh wow. my goodness! Yeah, what, what what's your explanation? Is that, is that what it's like? Is that what? what it's like? Is that what it's like for for totality? Yeah, yeah. that was yesterday yeah. for me. Yeah, it got really dark. Yeah. yeah, I was right under yeah. it. I, I had a good like couple of minutes of totality. Uh, I live kind of south lake ontario and it was completely dark just like they said the the animals yeah. all just got silent and i could hear all the drums hooting and hollering and uh it was it was just like midnight i've, I've never experienced that before but I, I was pretty impressed you can still <laughs> kind of see the ring around it but the ring like the way the sun shines on on the shadow of the moon you can kind of see the light but we're in the shadow of the moon so it was it was dark as as midnight where i was it was awesome yeah uh, the, I brought I brought this up yesterday uh, on the MDD Discord, and uh, the the thing that Flat Earther said to me was that, well, it would work the same on a flat Earth, but it's like, hey, it wouldn't because you are not saying that the moon is going like below the sun. So, and they just said, no, no, it will work the same on a flat Earth. It's like, well, okay, you're not yeah. explaining anything to me, but sure. That's a standard response from them. Oh, yes. Look, uh, yesterday, Ross had a debate with FTFE. Uh, and Ross yesterday said that he didn't know what it was that covered the sun yesterday. Well, then they'll say, well, well, the moon and the sun are supposed to be traveling east to west. So so why was the sun covered up west to east? It was like, well, because because... The moon is orbiting the Earth at like half a degree per hour, so so it, it, it has the appearance of traveling across the stars, in in contrast to the stars or the sun, west to east, like that's what's happening, because the Earth is rotating at fifteen degrees per hour, the moon is is moving at half a degree per hour, so it has the appearance of moving in relationship to the sun west to east but the overall travel is still east to west but anyways it's, it's so funny and then uh, the other thing i heard is like well they used to predict eclipses back in the day in the ancient time it's like yeah sure but not to the second like we get the predictions nowadays yes the debate is starting soon alex sorry i was uh, adjusting my chair alex is starting is asking, yes, the debate will start soon, but we will do a watch party here so uh, we, we can watch all together and we don't have to subject you to the toxicity of Jaren's uh, chat. 
Tyler, do you have any predictions for what's happening in the debate today? More hand waving than a traffic cop. Uh, uh, I'd like to, I don't know. It, it's just pretty standard with this sort of thing. I've mentioned in the past uh, flat earth fatigue, but uh, I feel like given the circumstances of, of recent events, they might try to address a flat earth model for the uh, the eclipse. So that could be entertaining. I hope Oz is prepared, but he, he's usually pretty thoroughly well read on everything by now from what I've seen of the uh, his, his content leading up to now. Well, the, the topic I, I, of, the, of the debate is gravity, uh, downward bias, gravity and mass oh. or electrostatics. Okay. That, those are I thought it was aether cosmology, but I guess that's kind of a yeah, it's still fair take on cosmology. it. Mm -hmm. okay. So yeah, I guess it's, it's <laughs> I, I, you know, when it comes to this sort of thing, my prediction will be for them to say, well, we don't know how it works, but we know your model isn't how it works because we just don't trust NASA and we don't trust science and we don't trust, you know, all the decades and centuries of scientific knowledge that's like been built on a foundation of other scientific knowledge. But then what they'll do is, is they'll go back to something that's like centuries old and they'll talk about that as if that's the truth. So it, it that that seems to be pretty standard for mm -hmm. their uh Josh uh Jackson asked question do you guys think Jaren actually believes the earth is flat or just does this for money and attention uh Brenda was bringing this up uh before so um uh, I think he I, believes I it's know. I think he believes it's flat I'm not sure if he believes in the ether cosmology or if he's just trying to find because people ask questions that they're just trying to find answers, even if the answers aren't validated. Like, I, that's why I respect people like Flat Suede, like them or not, where they appeal to the Bible as a foundation rather than these people who just make stuff up. Um, even though, like, okay, you could say the Bible's made up, some people would, but at least it has some historical context that a lot of people accept is true and there's some there are arguments to accept that god exists and for the bible to be true and stuff on that historical evidence but the ether cosmology stuff that they're reifying these other concepts for like light like we know light travels we've known the speed of light well before we gave up the concept of the ether like maxwell and all these other people they appeal to we went through all the papers right like all those papers we already knew the speed of light We've already measured the speed of light well before Einstein came up with the special relativity. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I mentioned, I saw, I heard in passing on the last Witset debate was that he didn't accept that light travel. Yeah. And that is baffling. It's like, well, you can turn on the light over there. I have a light there in the, in the corridor. And the light is coming from the bulb into here. So how do you like, how do you how know I, that? But how like well, if I go from here to there, I have to move. Where's right? the color? Where's the color from my shirt coming from? Is it coming from the light or is it coming from the shirt? Both. The, is it both? Yes. Or I disagree. Mostly the shirt. The, the shirt, shirt. it's yeah. not reflecting that's that's like what they teach you like rudimentary wise what's happening is the 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 molecules the elect the atoms absorb the light the it's like i'm not sure the quantum theory of um photons oh, yeah. but basically what happens is it absorbs the photons the electrons get excited and it emits um, photon packets at a specific frequency. That frequency of photon packets is this color. So anything that's above absolute zero uh, emits photons as due to second law of thermodynamics, right? As it cools down to absolute zero. So that's where you can use infrared devices 
to see the infrared spectrum of everything emitting um, infrared. So everything emits infrared as long as it's not absolute zero. So you can use the special devices to capture those photons that are being released as the electron orbits or as the electrons um, um, get, become less excited as things cool down. They, right. uh, they emit a different frequency of infrared. So it's emitting, I, you are always emitting EMF as long as you're not absolute zero. Uh, Mark was saying, why does fiber optics have latency then? Yep. That's a um, point. Two, two reasons, and, and Mark knows this because he's an IT guy. Two reasons, it's because um, light <laughs> travels. Yeah. <laughs> and... <laughs> and you got a uh, you got a processing delay. So you have two things. You got processing delay for the fiber optic to the digital processing, and you got a a travel delay, um, loop delay. So you always have to, and the loop delay is dependent upon the length of the fiber cable. So you can yeah. literally measure the length of the fiber cable to program the the loop delay and the process delays fixed within a specific range for the devices connected to. So you can know the overall loop de do loop delay based on, and I'm talking about lines that are like a hundred miles long where we run direct fiber along the tower, right? And um, yeah, run direct fiber along the tower and you can calculate what the, like 36 milliseconds or whatever it is, mm -hmm. um, loop delay or microseconds, yeah. microsecond, it wouldn't be millisecond, it'd be like microseconds. Oh, yeah. uh, we have we have Neo with us. Al X is Neo. Oh, he's apparently. changed his name. Yes, trying to stay hidden oh, from the. So the I I gotta go, guys. Thing. All right. Shane sent me the link. Um, I, um, I'm not sure. I'm gonna at least mute myself. Okay. Dog blast. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> and now we wait because uh, it, on Jared's channel things tend to go. Uh, okay, he left. <laughs> But on General's channel, he lent, t things tend to get uh, delayed. Uh, Industrial Nerd says, Happy Tuesday. Happy Tuesday to you today. But today we're having a Matters Now day. Uh, Toon is not having any stream because he's uh, traveling back from uh, seeing uh, the, the eclipse. And uh, uh, Miles Wilson has some advice for us. Don't get too smug in you questioning the ether. Flat Earth, a nice old lady told me it is third us all the way down. Every glow of evidence can always be overcome by heavenly energy. Well, yes, uh, I guess you could say that, but it's not it's not convincing argument. And Mark, uh, we have a bunch of uh, positive messages for us. Let me get my window there. I'm monitoring the the, the Jaren's channel so I can make sure to stream it whenever it starts and we can watch it all together uh here on the panel if you want to make any comment you feel free and uh, everyone in the audience i will keep an eye out in the chat and we can sort of do a watch party here i will try not to post it so we don't miss anything of what they're saying uh but if we have to post it we can post it and then uh, catch up in 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 extra speed we can go worse speed so i just uh, hope that there's a coherent argument like it, it, if it was because i i've taken debates for things that i believe in as well as things that i don't believe in and so i try to kind of do that devil's advocate approach to either side of the debate that i'm on what, what is my interlocutor gonna propose so that i can kind of have some rhetoric stockpiled for it right and, if I was a flat earther or, or, or a aether cosmologist, I would kind of do like a bit of a, um, like, have you ever heard that adage, like a fish doesn't know what's in water until it's on the side of the bank, you know, like for a fish, water, like, I don't think they see water. They just kind of move around and, and go around and do their thing. And for the longest time, that's what it was for people. Like we just kind of viewed air as air until we understood the chemistry of air and, and like the atmosphere and stuff like that. And so if I was on the uh, aether cosmologist side, I would just say that 
that which we don't understand about the vacuum of space and and like what we perceive as being like empty and gravity and all that dark matter dark energy and stuff like that it's simply no different than a fish not knowing that they're in water until they're suffocating on the side of the bank and likewise if we're out in space it's it's not a good time because we do you know we are attuned for this and kind of work with an angle on uh it, it, it's yet to be discovered and it's, it's just kind of unknown territory which seems to me to be a rather coherent argument because i i'm fully confident that you know decades or centuries from now however long it takes we will have a better understanding of what's going on out there and we'll have better calculations and better models for our reality but i'm not at all hopeful that that's what they'll come out with i wonder um uh... A recent, I've recently been seeing that uh, this paper from the information that came out last year from Gupta about uh, the a, a new kind of proposition for cosmology that kind of takes uh, double the age of the universe, but it does away with dark matter and dark energy. And I've been I've been starting to see that more gain more and more traction. So I wonder what they will say, because a big objection is that, well, dark matter, dark energy, 95% of the universe and blah, blah, blah. We all know the spiel. But I wonder what they will say that if that becomes like the, the consensus that we don't need dark matter and dark energy, but uh, the universe is twice as old as we, th we thought it was. So that, that would that would be an interesting uh, thing. I've been keeping an eye on that, and I, I'm starting to ask that question because it seems to be getting a lot of traction. Uh, Guitarista has a bit of a different uh, opinion of you, Tyler. He says, fish know they're in water or they wouldn't jump out of the water to get birds or bugs. That uh, that's a fair assessment, I would say. Both are fair. We 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 will probably never know until we can read fish's mind. Yeah, uh, what Archer, I can say. Did they tell you that? Uh, Archer fish. Archer fish will squirt water at bugs on leaves to, and then force them to drop into the water, and then they eat them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they go keeping like. With, keeping with my analogy, I mean, we could dig into the ground and find worms, and there are fish that kind of like kick up the sediment on the bottom and, and hide and stuff like that. And, and we can like throw stuff in the air and see birds. And, and I, I believe we've gone to the moon so we can kind of understand something that we don't fully understand. And I, and I can't help but think that that's a fair analogy for what fish are experiencing when they're like jumping in the waves and stuff like that. And obviously it, it taking back in could not uh, prove it. In dark space, with uh, well, where did dark energy go? Basically, this is what I'm understanding. Uh, oh. You you would need to understand both propositions of cosmology. You would need to understand the proposition of the Big Bang and why they say that uh, dark energy and dark matter is a thing. And you will also need to read and understand Gupta's paper. So you have a lot of homework to. Well, the TLDR of it is that there's kind of like a cosmic web and there's spaces in between that cosmic web where the galaxies reside that's just like completely empty space. And if you go too far in, you literally can't see light for many of the galaxies or any of the stars and things like that. And I think the theory is essentially that there's this type of energy that is just dense and it's in that spot. And that's why the less dense... Uh, space <laughs> is is where the galaxies formed um i know that if you watch an explosion in very slow motion you'll see more dense and less dense areas of that explosion as it kind of comes out and that was kind of used to explain like the formation of celestial bodies in accordance with the big bang kind of a thing but as well as that um what would they call it the cosmic web the, the galactic web kind of a thing it's similar to how we discovered uh, Neptune, and uh, like w we saw that uh, there was an irregularity in the orbit of other planets. So we hypothesized that 
there um, that there might be uh, something there. And then as we got uh, better technology, we went and looked and figured out. It's like, oh, hey, yeah, there's something there. The problem with dark matter and dark energy is that we still don't have uh, a way to detect it. But uh, one of the conspiracies that I saw on Creaky Blinders video about the eclipse is that one guy was saying that, oh, look, they're turning on the Large Hadron Collider the day of the eclipse. They must be doing something. But the the experiment has been going since uh, March 8th, and it's trying to detect uh, dark matter. So we still don't know, but this, uh, this Gupta idea has been getting a lot of traction. And uh, maybe it changes because that's that's the awesome and beautiful thing about science. If you bring a world-breaking paradigm and it's correct, uh, people will be convinced and people will mm -hmm. change their mind. We might still try to find dark matter because that's what science does. It tries to uh, look at everything it can. And maybe at some point, if we don't find it, we'll go like, okay, yeah, well, there's no dark matter. Well, this, but, that'll, be, that'll be a criticism. That'll become a criticism. It will be, well, can't you guys make up your minds? Science doesn't know anything because it keeps changing. Right. Yeah. So we see that, we see that as a, um, as a positive. Science is always, but oh, you're bringing up a bit. A lot of the people. There we go. I'm sorry. Just a lot of the people. A lot of the people are okay. I'm. I might switch. I might switch to my PC. I'm on the phone. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. We can wait for you. No problem. But yeah, you broke up a little bit. But uh, I, most of us, I think, would agree that yeah, that's the beautiful thing about science is that uh, we are able to change and update our models. Everyone remembers when doctors would say that, hey, smoking is good for you, even if you're pregnant. And then we learned more and we realized that it wasn't. Uh, Miles Wilson says, uh, science is beautiful and efficient. One model that fits all aspects except one, which are more theoretical. Yeah, but everything is like theoretical and hypothetical until we uh, verify it. And we are having a... Uh, uh, Many people join. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. Hi, Ozzy and Max, Billy, Tyler, Brenda, Chad. Thank you, NetTube user, for being here with us. Uh, today, we have a mega stream. We had the pre-show, which uh, we, we're done with. We're not just waiting for the show to start. And when the debate starts, we're going to have a watch party here with everyone. So uh, if you want to uh, discuss it, every, anyone on the panel, if you want to discuss it, uh, we can pause the video, but I, I want to try to just let it let it run. Uh, so for the people in the side chat, if you're watching here with us, uh, you can tag at Matters Now or you can tag me at Max, and uh, we can put your messages on screen like this while the debate is going. The format today will be the uh, timed format that they have been doing. Each one of them gets uh, 45 minutes and they have a couple of uh, buzzers to take over the conversation. Um, so that format has been working. I think Oz uh, has the idea. He, he's seen that the strategy of getting some time, not just uh, rambling on and saving some time for the end actually works quite well because it leaves you an opportunity to talk and interrupt it with the other person muted, which is big brain move. <laughs> and um, uh, Jeff C says, Jaron does and he's mostly fair. Yes, uh, I most people would agree that as a, as a format, uh, I'm sorry, as a moderator, he is good. And I got confused reading this. Uh, Jamie Shapiro says, I do like Jaron's new format. It introduces some strategy. Correct. Yes. And it it makes you value the time that you have to speak, not just rambling on and going straight to the point. So 
I, I do like both aspects of that. All right, we have Brenda back here. Hello, long time no see. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you should you should notice a difference in the microphone quality. Yes, you sound absolutely awesome right now. It's a it's it's a cheap USB mic, uh, Fifine. F I F I N E from Amazon. It was around fifty bucks. Okay, how yeah, about you? Sound crisp right now. It's it's perfect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sydney Raptor says first law of flareful dynamics. <laughs> I think that needs to be coined on a shirt. <laughs> that is funny. Uh, can you guys give me one second? Uh, someone uh, say uh, say something. I, I need to get water. Uh, okay, I'll just say that you don't need a beard to appear on stage. Uh, even <laughs> though the three of us have very rugged beards, it, it's not a prerequisite. You can hit that stream yards thing. Uh, I'm just I'm just talking, I guess. Yeah, don't forget to hit the like button. Tell your friends that you can be on the internet show if, if you come down to matters now. And and once again, you don't need a beard to do it, but uh, it, it's it's just a thing. Come on over. I did a pretend housekeeping. <laughs> All right. I don't know what you said, but I agree. Whatever Tyler said, everyone <laughs> listen to him. <laughs> I, I just heard something about beards, and we support beards as matters now. Yes. Beards and bald heads. That, but we're uh, not beard exclusive. If, if you don't yeah, have exactly. a beard, you're still welcome up on stage. I, I do not have a beard, and I do not have a bald head. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't matter. We, we support those, but it's not exclusionary. Uh, Ashton says, usually it's all bald dudes. Yes, except Tyler that he has hair for all of us. That's how we compensate things. Tyler's hair. It's kind of interesting. It's kind of interesting how fashions change because, uh, you know, not many years ago, um, it was not typical for men to have beards in America, at least. I don't think, I, I mean, I could be wrong. It, my sense remembering TV from the 60s and 70s is not a lot of bearded men. Mm -hmm. If you had a beard, you were probably a Marxist. Yes. Wow. Well, good thing I'm not a Marxist. And for the record, I'm also not an American. So I'm, not, I'm, I'm in Canada. I'm <laughs> yeah, B no. Billy is also well, the pan yeah, major Canada, majority yeah. Canadian. That is fun. And I'm uh, I'm South American. Yeah. Uh, I saw Jaron, I haven't had a time to watch it yet, but I saw Jaron do a video about planes and distances in the South. Didn't I, see, I didn't see that. Yeah. I want to see it, but I'm afraid that I will just punch the screen. Because, like, just so you know, the South works the same way as the north so if i drive 100 kilometers in the south it's 100 kilometers there's no weirdness here the distances work exactly the same because the world is a ball but they don't seem to understand that. i think they should come to the south and uh, and figure some of these things out Ah, we have a, a message here from Jeff C. Go Canada! We are cool, both literally and figuratively. Uh, yes. Canada, you know, that's basically Marxist anyway. Yes. That's... Uh... Uh, come on, man. That's not fair. <laughs> I, I, we're, pretty close to, we're pretty close to socialist country, I guess. That's fair yeah, enough. but the vast majority of Canadians, at least that I know, are very much opposed to the Trudeau regime. So, like, the government oh, yeah. and the people... Are, are completely far removed from each other. Like, if you wanted to say Canada is, at this point is just a vassal for China, I, I would agree, but that's the government's fault. That's not our fault. What do you mean a vassal for China? I don't know much about the politics of Canada these days, to be honest. Uh, in, in, the, in the last election, after the election, the Chinese government came out and openly admitted that they helped Trudeau get reelected even though he lost a lot of seats. So it, it's kind of just a thing where a lot of people who would call, I, I remember there was talk of like Donald Trump being Putin's puppet. 
And it was all debunked. I mean, the person who came up with the, the Russian dossier admitted that it was fabricated. But for the Chinese government to come out and say that they outright helped Trudeau in the last election, that, lend, that has a, a lot more weight. And the Trudeau government, in response to that, they kind of made it so that, like, uh, social media and meta and a bunch of other internet entities would no longer be able to display news or broadcast news. So there was like this big crackdown on fake news. And it just seems that like that's kind of like their way of admitting that, yeah, Trudeau is uh, is, is owned and operated and puppeted by, uh, what is it, President Xi. There's, there's a lot of other things too, like uh, the politics our trade with so, China, the way the dairy awesome. industry in Canada is set up, and it's it's kind of uh, regulated in a way that it can be shipped off to China. So there, there's a lot of uh, vassal-esque uh, type of things. Oh, uh, hold on. Uh, J.B. Shapiro brought something up. Uh, white night happens in northern areas where they have entire nights of always sunlight, but you can't always see the sun. All right, the debate is starting. Yes, we have talked about this and talked about the 24 hour sun, which it is supposed to go to Antarctica to see it, but he already has his ex excuses planned out. And uh, okay, he has a one minute and a half ticker, and then he has a very weird intro that will probably get us struck. So I'm not going to play that. But we'll be starting the watch party right away. Ah. Yay. Let's get ready to debate. Or yes. He has like a Bruce Buffer. So Wissett has talked about um, appearing possibly on the uh, Alex Jones show, I think. Have you heard about that? No. Really? Uh, he's mentioned. I heard him say Joe Rogan, too, or something. They're trying to that, get Joe Rogan. That was not true. That was not true. That was somebody that's, that's somebody just news. made that made that up. Huh. That but is I think, interesting. I think he's trying to or might actually because uh, I don't know the status of these things, but but he's I'm sure he would love to, you know, if he had the opportunity to appear on Alex Jones. And people ask why do we oppose them? This is why. This is why. <laughs> yes. Because, because this this is this is um it's bad information. It, it's a, it's a, it's a wrong belief that that needs to die. But it never will. But <laughs> it it needs to be, it needs to be a small number of people. I agree to some extent. I, I always kind of came up with the whole museum of bad ideas. Uh, I believe that Nazism should not be practiced, but I don't think we should erase it from history. We should put it in a museum so people can say, look at this terrible ideology and worldview. Can you imagine that there were people that believed in that? And I, for the record, I think that uh, communism, Islam, and flat earth belong in the museum of bad ideas also. Oh, but the, the, you, you're, uh, you, you don't like <laughs> Islam. I, I don't really have that big of a problem, but maybe it's because we have different experiences. Uh, Shady Eyes uh, gives you a, a bunch of messages, Brenda. It's not Alex Jones. It's an InfoWars host. Alex Jones is very anti-Flat Earth. Uh, the name of the host is Harrison Smith. So thank you for that, uh, Shifty Eyes. Oh, okay. It's very, uh, the people in the audience are very well informed. I love that. Uh, I didn't know. Is, is InfoWars dis, um, distinct from Alex Jones now? Is that? He runs it. Yeah, I mean, the one who runs it, though, I guess. Uh, I, I just don't pays watch his legal fees. I don't watch it, so I, I just don't know what's going on over there. Yeah, me neither. Uh, Tinker Phil gives us more information. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Alan was the one that claimed that he was going to be on Joe Rogan. He still claims it's been moved to the 29th or something like that. And Shifty Eyes, uh, it has multiple hosts. Alex Jones is, has been in a lot of trouble. <laughs> Lately, and uh, we can say that he is broke. And uh, Jeff C says Alex still owns it until he's probably forced to sell it. All right, they're done with the intro. Let's see where we're at, and let me choose the best. 
display mode. I think we'll go with this one and this one. Ah, ah shoot. I forgot to add the audio because, you know, I'm sorry, I'm dumb. Uh, window. Debatism. Uh, 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 uh. Why are you not letting me share the damn audio? Okay, I'm going to have to open it on a Chrome tab. Give me one second. You were not missing anything yet, so. Don't well, take your time. I got to change my earphones. I think one's dead. All right. There we go. Put this here. Do that. Do that. Share. Share. Uh, window. Debatism. Oh, Chrome tab. Debatism. Share audio. Um, there we go. All right. Uh, anyone would kindly let me know if that uh, if the audio is coming through. Oh shoot! Don't 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 buffer. Thanks for hosting, Jaren. Thanks to thanks. Good to be here. And um, everyone. Enough. Right? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I'm be able to be found pretty much adl.place. We'll link you to everywhere I am, Twitter, BitShoot, Odyssey, Rockfin, Rumble, etc. That's all where we're at. And uh, this is going to be, I think, a really good, respectful exchange of uh, ideas. So thanks, everyone. Fantastic. Yep. And both the links are in the description. We are going a little bit longer today rather than the normal 30 minutes each. We're going to do 45 minutes each. And instead of the uh, two buzzers, they'll get three. So that's basically what we're doing. And we're going to start out with a coin toss. Let me get that on the screen here. And we'll let Shane do it because Shane is a first timer. And uh, what do they say? Beauty before brains. Sorry, I was in, but it's just where we got to go. All right. So you get to choose between uh, Debatism X or Modern Day Debates. Which one do you choose? X for sure. See, let's see. Let's see. It is. The debate topic is gravity. Uh, is it electrostatics or uh, mass attracting mass and ether cosmology? Okay. So just to explain how it goes real quick, it is a first time for uh, Shane. Uh, Ozine's going to go first, which means he's going to give us a one-minute intro. Shane's going to follow with his one-minute intro, and that's just meant to say, here's my position. This is what I'm going to be trying to show tonight. After that, both clocks will be set at 45 minutes. Ozian will begin, and he'll just start talking, and he can go as long as he wants. If at any time uh saint pierre wants to take over he's going to ring his buzzer you'll hear it i'll hear it and then within the next 10 seconds i will switch you button to the other person uh, they each get three of those and that's basically Can anyone it. hear me both clocks end. somebody did ask what happens if one person's clock yeah. well, one person's clock yeah. ends the other person gets the floor for the remainder of the night so that's basically it uh go ahead and start us out with a, your clocks at one minute go ahead ozzy when you start talking we will start your one minute give us an intro what are you trying to prove tonight yeah, I want to argue that mass attracting mass is the ex best explanation for why things fall down. And even if you did appeal to something like electrostatics for why things follow down, such a force still would create a sphere, would still explain why we have a pressure gradient, would still not falsify a flat Earth, and would still support the idea that we've gone to space and stuff like that. So it's not anything that would prove um, any of those claims are false and that we can all do an experiment to prove that mass does attract math. We've done very good tests and I'm going to go over that concept. I also want to discuss that we don't need a medium for light to propagate. We do not need an ethium that uh, medium that light does travel as a particle and as a wave. And that's my minute. Beautiful. And Shane, go ahead. When you start talking, we'll start your minute for your intro. Uh, all right, let's go. So we got a little basic intro here. Let's take it off with essentially we're going to argue that electrostatics is the electromagnet. And electromagnetism are the governing forces that determine the downward vector. They uh, determine the vector, which is a zero magnitude, but determines a non-zero direction down, and then density, buoyancy, viscosity, sort everything else out. 
general forces sort everything out, right? So they do the equivalent work of G, not electrostatics as itself as the force replacing. And you can always get the agreed upon average 9.8 meters per second, but it does vary. It's not a constant, right? It varies with latitude. So you can just easily derive this uh, kinematic acceleration with height over one half t squared, essentially just meaning A equals two times the height over the time squared will always get you the agreed upon average of 9.8 whenever you need to use it. So A, A will replace G, all good. And then we can also prove that using the Van de Graaff generator, you can change the polarity and the charge distribution uh, ratio so that it would go up and change, become less dense than the air around it. So the charge distribution potential has to be manipulated for that to happen. And that's the causal mechanism for Time. the downward acceleration. Okay. Thank you very much. We are ready to go. This should be fun. Uh, both clocks are going to be set at 45. There we go. And oh, Ozian, you're going to begin. Both your buzzers work and they are on. Uh, yes. Okay, good. All right. So uh, we'll get started. And if you guys want to ask any questions throughout this conversation, if you think of something, you can send a super chat through YouTube. You can send a tip through Rockfin um, and ask your question there. We'll get to those at the very end and let's get it on. Good luck, guys. We're looking forward to this one and uh, see if anybody will change their worldview. Is gravity or is the downward bias a result of gravity and mass or is it electrostatics? Let's begin starting with you, Ozian, and I'll be muting you, uh, St. Pierre. Yeah, I'd like to share my screen really quick, um, if you can pull it up. Mm -hmm. Pull it up! Let's, up. Let's see one second. Shout out, bro. Yes, <laughs> go ahead. Okay, uh, there it is. All right, so basically I'm going to uh, look at dropping one cubic meter of lead. He did appeal to a Van de Graaff generator for electrostatic saying we can change the polarity, which means we can affect the electrostatic charge. And electrostatics is about like charges of repelling each other and unlike charges uh, attracting each other. So you are appealing to that um, concept, which means all the properties of electrostatics should apply. On Earth, we do have a terminal velocity for a cubic meter of lead of 262 meters per second. Where is it going? Um, with the DC formula, if you're looking at the that type of property, we have a 400,000 volts difference between the top of the atmosphere to the ground is about 10 micro microamps. And that's actually about 24 hertz, which is equivalent to about four microwatts. But for lead to be able to actually drop at the rate it needs to, you would need about 29.18 megawatts. So we need an explanation for where we're getting all that power from. And electrostatics does not provide that explanation. Neither does buoyancy. We need an explanation for that, where that force is coming from. We need to ex explain where this kinetic energy is actually coming from. And we get that from mass attracting mass. And so under this type of acceleration to get to accelerate at one meter per second, it would take 1,417,750,000 seconds at four microwatts. But on Earth, it actually takes um, 0 0.102 seconds to accelerate to one, milli one meter per second. Um, here we go again. To, for it to actually reach the ground at that rate of that uh, power, it would take 11,909,000 seconds, but on Earth, it only takes about three minutes to reach the ground. And here's Feynman's lecture on the Cavendish experiment that we can all do. The idea was to hang by a very, very fine quartz fiber, a rod with two balls. And then put two large lead balls in the positions indicated here next to it on the side. Then because of the attraction of the balls, there would be a slight twist of the fiber. It had to be done so delicately because the gravitational force between ordinary things is very, very tiny indeed. And there it was. And it was possible then to measure the force between these two balls. Cavendish called his experiment weighing the earth. We're pedantic and careful today. We wouldn't let our students say that. You would have to say they're measuring the mass of the Earth. So there's a... But the reason he say that, said that is the following. By a direct experiment, he was able to measure the force and the two masses and the distance and thus determine the gravitational constant. You say, yes, but we have the same situation on the Earth. We know what the pole is, and we know what the mass of the object pulled is, and we know how far away we are. 
but we don't know the, either the mass of the Earth or the constant, but only the combination. So by measuring the constant and knowing the facts about the pull of the Earth, the mass of the Earth could be determined. So indirectly, this experiment was the first determination of how heavy or how massive is the ball on which we stand. The but, ball! Uh, it's a kind of an amazing achievement to find that out, and I think that's why Cavendish named his experiment that way, instead of determining the constant in the gravitational equation. Weighing the Earth, the most. He incidentally was weighing the sun and everything else at the same time. Because the pull of the sun is known in the same manner. So like you see in that experiment, the independent variable is the distance between the masses, dependent variables of force, and Newtons measured by the portion of the bar swing. We have very controlled experiments we can do now, which are much better than the experiment that Cavendish actually did perform himself. The control variables are the four masses, the torsion wire, and the experimental conditions that we can't control for. Torsion indicates horizontal gravitational force isolated from Earth's gravity. The formula force equals um, the constant times the first mass times the second mass divided by the distance squared. And then you can just measure Earth's gravity using a, um, oh, one of those little force meters. I have the word for it here. It is called, a t um, it doesn't matter what it's called. I can't remember the name. I have memory issues. But anyways, I just want to know how you can explain why things fall down um, and why the things that do affect electrostatics are not affecting why things fall down in your model. Are you done sharing screen? Thank I'm, you. I'm... Go ahead, St. Cool. Oh, yeah. So, um, Ozzy, man, that demonstration was nice, a mathematical flushed out straw man, right? So if you've equi <laughs> equivocated the direct work uh, potential as electrostatics doing the force, it's exactly what we didn't say, right? It only determines the vector. It's a very light non-zero magnitude, but the direction is down for everyone. That means that if to properly account for it, you'd have to use the other forces to do the bulk replacement of G, right? So density, buoyancy, viscosity at a certain degree that they Little determine time the density and that affects why where things go up or down, right? So the math you did was excellent. I mean, if you equivocate that, right? If you put it into the formula here, you get, oh, well, actually you can use what you put up and then get that, well, the actual formula for gravity being the kinematic derivation we mentioned earlier, right, which would always be this right here, again, would be A equals 2H over T squared. We could just go right to your video and apply that and get, well, actually, what that object fell within 23 seconds. And then you can try to replace that G with the electrostatic force to rev up for six months to get the same equivalent of our trillion seconds or whatever. But the proper derivation would be the new formula with probably columns uh, volt per, per kilometer, I think, or whatever the unit would be to get the d density electric electric potential ratio versus density of mass to get the actual effect would be some sort of combination of columns constant and gravitational constant. You did mention gravitational constant. That is awesome. We'd love to algebraically define that. We'd love to also go with the, the Newton's law of gravitation, which we can use to derive Kepler's law from uh, Newton's law from, from Kepler's law, meaning we can equate centripetal to gravitational force, and then the mass would itself cancel out going poof. And then we can say that, well, this can't be a dynamic cause of gravity, hence the basis for a mass attracting mass, because there's no mass in the equation at all. What if Kepler perfectly described the orbital period and the periodicity of the celestial objects, and Newton came along and tried to do the same thing but for a dynamic cause that didn't exist, tricked the world with a kinematic derivation that was supposed to be a dynamic injection, right? Look, we have a dynamic force, or a kinematic derivation which was posing as a dynamic force. Otherwise, today, we wouldn't be able to do this nice little math trick where we can remove uh, mass, mass from the trick. universal gravitation from Newton and just replace it with the approximation of the periodicity or, you know, the A, th a to the third equals T squared, which would just be Kepler's basic law. And then we have Newton coming along actually and saying, well, we can actually derive most of Newton's laws from Kepler's laws. There's several papers that go through the math 
of that. And then we go back to the constants, right? So we have not only the gravitational constant, we have Coulomb's constant, which would be an equivalent, right? So we have, let's see, the constant. So Coulomb would be this law, right? Of course, F equals KQ1, Q2 over R squared. It comes out to 9.0 times 10 to the 9. Interesting comparison. You went, went over this one, the value of G in Newtons. And then, of course, the difference between them. Well, there are screen sharing? Formulaically, symbolically, uh -huh. mathematically, the only thing difference would be. So no one can read. Would the inverse relationship Yeah, this, to is, mass this is not an honest way to do also, it. Also, the constants and the strength of the respective forces are structurally similar, but have an inverse, they both have the inverse relationship to mass, so it has the inverse square law, relationshiply, but they have these other equivalents, right? So if one is a repellent force and one's a repellent and an attractive force, depending on the period of the squares, then which one would be a more acceptable force of the dynamic cause of everything, especially considering that we've just inserted mass as a dynamic cause based on an observation that was then mathematically removed and has no relevance, however, has never been tested, proven, or substantially verified as the causal mechanism of anything. Whereas using the Van de Graaff generator to alter the polarity to a degree to outweigh the charge density for the, the density of an object will make it float. Just like we've all seen human hair, wood filings, iron will all go up, will change the electrostatic direction by changing that variable. Of course, the gases in the atmosphere would do the same thing, even at an atomic level, right? The separation of layers of atoms would be electrically governed, meaning that the denser it is, the more electric potential it has. And all these rules follow the existence of that gradient we have in the atmosphere between, you know, what we assume are two Gaussian surfaces, which, by the way, can definitely be curved. We have a nice uh, explanation, I think, right here for what a Gaussian surface would look like as a spherical half charge distribution layer, essentially. Right, if we go, let's see here. Yeah, so we have two Gaussian surfaces that gives us the voltage gradient. The gradient itself is the dielectric acceleration determining down for everyone. And of course, the other forces that exist always sort each other out. I feel like I've been talking a while. Okay, <clears throat> go ahead, Ozan. Yes, and you said nothing. Yeah, uh, so what is a Coulomb? Like you, you're describing forces, what's a Coulomb? You mean the unit of measurement or the Coulomb's constant we defined over here as the a unit as a unit of measurement of measure of what? Ooh. What is the Coulomb? Answer the question. Hurry up! Are you googling it? He's googling it. Voltage, charge potential, electromagnetic potential. So you have the charge mm -hmm. potential difference, right? So you have Q one, Q one, Q two. If it takes you that long, then you must be Googling it, or you, you don't actually know. So why am I even listening to you then? Uh, he got it question? there. He knows he can't point? answer. Did, did I That's what they Coulomb always say. Was. They say that you can't you look it up. The and charge, you just know this uh, charge potential difference, right? Because it's electrostatics would be charge potential moving, and this is Q1 and Q2 as the electrical charges. So that's what it would describe. Is that what you asked? Are you like, what? So what is it? What's what type of charge is it measuring? Oh, charge it's got in there. Electrostatic charges, man. That's the uh, the constant, right? If in Coulomb's comparison to gravitational equation, you haven't seen that one. It's the same exact formula, right? Can you show me uh, a reference for the what a Coulomb is? What a, a reference for what a Coulomb is? Mm -hmm. I can just tell you. Yeah, why don't you just tell me? A coulomb is a specific number of electrons. It's a charge of electrons, number of electrons. Charge potential, right. Well, if you don't believe in electrons, you could say it's, you know, the radiation of <laughs> a different layer, which would be the atmosphere, or what you would call the atomic cloud probability. We would just be like, well, that's, the, you know, the intersection of the fields and for the proliving event with the quantification of the induction rate of light as it processes through the medium or whatever. But yeah. <laughs> or so you're just reifying the concept that was of your own whatever so you don't actually know what a coulomb is so what's it what's an amp because you guys always do you believe in the Feynman lecture where it shows the 10 micro micro amps of current flow on the slide sheet the slide on the Feynman figure two on the Feynman lecture do I believe in the Feynman lecture? You mean, do I believe his worldview, his favorite color in every supposition he drew? No, no, no. The, the Feynman lecture that shows the 400 kilovolts of electric charge to the atmosphere and the 10 micro micro amps yeah. of current flow. 
So that's one instance, 4,000 meters up specifically, and it scales and gets way bigger the higher you go, right? So that whole example was just using 4,000 meters as a base for the whole world or whatever? 50,000, 50, uh, 50 kil kilometers. So there's hundreds of thousands of volts that you're ignoring in the charge potential there to just say that it's all based on that 4,000 meter up figure of 400,000 volts is weird. We There's use also a Faraday cage. You know, how to charge things act around each other and things which exist within an electrostatic field. So different. So, so if we reverse the charge, will things float? It depends on the density, right? You can't just reverse the charge. You actually have to overcome the disparity. Cars wouldn't work properly if we didn't know about how these work, how electrons potential. work. So if you have a denser medium, it takes Our car much more work. electric potential to overcome that ratio, right? Density That's why you can't get heavy things to float. Well, density meaning you know the was it p over p equals m over v which would just be the measure in a given volume <laughs> with mass you don't even need to algebraically switch anything out for that one so the the specific the density difference between two items it depends on the density of the two items whether it can float or not how did you calculate that well, it's the, I mean, like, so if you change the potential of a wood filing or a, what, a giant brick of uh, gold or whatever, whatever heavy metal, <laughs> I mean, that's going to proportionally vary, right? You can't expect the same effect of a piece of hair that has a, a much lighter and density gradient relationship to the electric potential that it's being altered to have the same effect as a giant brick of, you know, say dielectric iron or whatever uh, paramagnetic material. So it's just a, it's a ratio that you have to overcome the same way you can make a human float. If, you know, you didn't destroy him with voltage first and sure. power, you can make the corpse float, I guess, right? Sure. Show me um, how much I would have to reverse the charge to get a one cubic meter block of lead to float. That's so interesting, right? We could probably figure the math out on that one, but it would be absurd, kind of like your one trillion seconds to accelerate to G using electrostatics as the dynamic force singularly. I mean, I, I calculated how many watts it would be. It'd be like 29 megawatts. For what? Oh, what my million, oh, he's so what? Lost. To get it to accelerate at 9.8 meters oh, per second squared. To accelerate it up to G. But like, so we're talking about a force replacing the 9.8 meters causal mechanism that is not electrostatic, right? Even when we say electromagnetic forces are 10 to the 36 power stronger than gravity, we're not speaking of electrostatic. We're speaking of the fundamental forces within electromagnetic. So we have to uh, kind of concentrate on the difference between electromagnetism and electrostatics, right? Electromagnetism has the four fundamental forces is the dominant force, right? They, they say between atoms, molecules, and it's the one that governs the density between atom and atomic layers, electrons, etc. Electrostatics is just the study of charges at less static electricity within the subset of electromagnetism, right? So when you say it's 10 to the 36 power stronger than gravity, and then you try to equate electrostatics to the fundamental force of electromagnetism, that's obviously not going to work. That's not a fair comparison. It would have to also include the respective work done by density, buoyancy, viscosity, and the other atmospheric, whatever conditions that would lead for an object to fall. What, what work does um, something that is 10 times more dense than water, do, what work does it do? What work does density do? I've never seen that before. Density well, is well, not a force. It doesn't do work in the physics formula for work as you employed it in your video, right? But that's because the fundamental force of gravity is already attributing for this major acceleration. However, if we were to redefine it in equivalent units, right, we would have to incorporate the actual fundamental forces people used to say density but density isn't doing that work it's electromagnetic downward vector density buoyancy viscosity things that will determine relationshiply are you denser or more buoyant than the things around you that determined generally if you go up or down after the down is set for everyone i know right i'm just looking for the formulas how can i use electrostatics to calculate if something's going to go up or down like i can use buoyancy i can use g Right. Well, we can use G, we can remove G, we can equivocate A with G because acceleration, of course, can be kinematically derived at any point based on height, time, and, uh, you know, uh, height, acceleration, and time, right, easily. So we can say that it's G or we can use A, we can do the same thing 
for buoyancy. We can redefine that with a nice little A, which is just the displacement plus the viscosity. We can just take a sure. look at, you know, density, downward acceleration, of course, A, and then B, the volume works the same way. Again, mass would just be replaced with little g for A again. Same thing. Weight, of course, is the same thing. Look at that. It's the same formula. And then density we have also it doesn't need any adjustments. We have mass and volume, right? So that's essentially what we're talking about as a governing property for what the electrostatic induction potential would be yes, as a proportionate totally ratio with objects. So once you overcome that density ratio with the electric potential, things could potentially change the downward right. vector. So uh, what is electricity? So if you build an electrostatic charge and you make a connection uh, with a load, uh, what does that produce? What is electricity? Is that what you said? Google. Yeah. So typically, if you build electrostatic charge between two objects, right, and you put a conductor on there, you produce electromagnetism, right? You produce a current flow between the two objects to produce electromagnetism. You produce electron flow, which is the when a number of electrons pass a given point at a specific period of time, one amp is when one coulomb of electrons pass a given point in one second. So that's where we get an amp from specifically. Nice. But so you, you appeal to electrostatics, but we have no specific. Do you think we can use electrical force and directly convert it to mechanical force? Because no, 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 it's not it at all, man. Right. Like, so, I mean, that's a nice a bit of knowledge uh, you demonstrated, Ozzy, and that's respect, dude. <laughs> that's good. That's epic. I mean, then it makes me think that you knew what you were doing with your video wasn't correctly arguing our position, right? Because that would be stupid for us to assume that this tiny subset of a uh, fundamental force is doing the replacement full force work of gravity, right? When you work on cars, you, know you have, have to take, you have to take static electricity into account, too. So, like, I mean... Yeah. There's a lot of things that no, I was account, quoting so. uh, the person who was advocating for it who said it was actually gravity. So they said electrostatics was gravity. So you might actually have a different worldview. So you can listen to my video where I specifically quoted the person who said it was gravity. So if you have no explanation for how it causes a downward bias, and um, first of all, electro electricity flow is negative to positive. The Feynman lecture doesn't, uh, electricity flow is not positive to negative. So I wanna know how you know um, it's positive to negative. Isn't it the case when you use a Van de Graaff generator, it is like charges repel and unlike charges um, attract? Yeah, so the conception of positive and negative could always be attributed to like states of equilibrium, charging seeks discharge, discharging seeks charge, and we could equivocate the potential of Earth to be discharging, right, to be grounded, to discharge a perpetual state of discharging, and then the antithesis, the sky, or the Gaussian surface with the curvature uh, equivalent would, would be the proposing, you know, discharging surface. And those two sorts of equilibrium would seek each other. And because of those Gaussian surfaces that exist, the voltage gradient kind of pops up as the direct result and evidence. Also, the way gases, I honest, uh, the way gases are distributed, the way atoms are distributed with the periodic table and the density, all of that supports the voltage gradient. But crap, I forgot what your question was, dude. <laughs> I like Isn't it lost. true in a Van de Graaff generator doesn't matter if you put positive on the top or positive on the bottom? Alike charges repel and unlike charges attract, and they'll the direction you get stuff to le levitate in the middle, regardless of the polarity. So the polarity of the Earth doesn't have any effect on the downward bias. You can prove that in a Van de Graaff generator. Not say it has a huge effect, right? You, you're saying that. When you use a Van de Graaff generator, you alter it so that you can show that changing the ratio of the charge doesn't affect the downward vector or that it does? Yeah, it has no uh, effect on downward vector. You can flip the polarities. You can cause things to levitate. You can guide things to go up. It depends on how you charge it from the top or the bottom. It has no effect on the vector. Well, I don't know what you mean because we make, you know, the exact opposite discovery when we change the polarity enough for the relative to the density to make objects that would not float regularly, literally float and change their downward vector to upward, right? Using this same potential, right? So we manipulate it. You say electrons and all that stuff and charge density, but we'll just get change the electric potential to outweigh the relationship of its density. And then 
it will float. Literally, the downward force, downward vector changes to upward vector, and all the same forces proceed to put it on the ceiling, right? Iron, human hair, essentially, we have coherent and incoherent forces, right? Things that are magnetism and ready to attract and or repel. And then you have the incoherent dielectric acceleration, the existence of the gradient propelling it as a general downward vector with a very non, very light non-zero magnitude. Yeah, that's the point. It's attracting uh, and repelling each other. It doesn't matter if the top is positive or negative. It's also most of the ones you use are like 30,000 volts, but the, the voltage gradient, the atmosphere is a 100 to 400 volts per meter. It depends on the atmospheric condition. It changes dramatically depending on where you're at, time of day, the conditions. But these Van de Graaff generators, you can flip them, turn them upside down. They still do the same things. Like charges repel, unlike charges attract, have no uh, um, thing at all to do with round, uh, the vector. And they should be allowed to levitate lead, but they don't. Well, you just have to figure out the actual math to levitate lead. How much potential would you have to do to overcome that density? It'd be much greater than human hair, you presume, right? But they could definitely do it. It would probably end oh, or you, you know explode or change existence of matter or whatever before it got to the overriding density. However, it's totally possible. The same thing when we first brought this up, McToon was like, how come I can't put a human in a Faraday cage and change the polarity and make him fly? And it's like, well, you made me blow up first because the, the amount of charge you need to overcome that density versus the human in the air is so such that it would literally fry the human. How are you going to blow up in the Faraday the cage? Potential to, change the downward vector what are you talking about? so we definitely have charging and discharging in states of equilibrium and i definitely can prove that with a van de graaff generator saying that it doesn't prove the vector because you can flip it up and down seems misguided but maybe i'm missing something yeah so if if it is density um what's what's causing density to cause things to go down because you could put the same item in the Van de Graaff generator, flip the polarities. It's not causing land to levitate. And you can do 35,000 volts, and it's not going to cause a, a block of lead to levitate um, where it will fall down um, because it's more dense than air in the atmosphere. What's causing it to fall down, but it's not levitating when you reverse the polarity in the Van de Graaff generator? It's not levitating. Well, because they dude, won't. I think <laughs> lead will never there's a definite relationship like that. that we can call a ratio between how the density of an object and the electric potential of an object demonstrated in the periodic table and all the mainstream stuff, right? So that's evident. Now we're going to try to ignore that and say that, well, density is now a new force doing all the work of gravity. Like we, the way that it has to work is the downward vector is determined by electrostatics lightly, essentially, right? Because that's the incoherent state of Earth. The charge potential that exists, the literal voltage gradient that we have has to be because of that, right? So that determines the vector. And then all the rest of the work that we keep attributing to other forces is literally done by density, buoyancy, and viscosity. Things will sort out, essentially, determining relatively, am I more or less dense, will make you go up or down once you have a down because of that down is set. This is how the forces act. We can change that down electrostatically. I don't understand how we can point at that. Is there like, say, an equivalent relationship for mass attracting mass where you can experimentally verify a say a variable that you can manipulate and then change the downward vector as well? Or is the gravitational forces that are purported to work on the cosmic scale that we can't see or verify or test only working out there in fantasy land and never working here where electromagnetism governs? Did he really just say fantasy land? So you're saying that maybe there's other unknown forces. It's not electrostatics. That's fine. Um, so I think we've refuted electrostatics. And just to go back to iron, iron isn't that much less dense than lead. Iron's about eight times um, more dense than water, where lead's about 13 times more dense than water. But you have no problem getting iron filings to levitate, but lead filings you have problems with because lead doesn't interact with electrostatics the same way that iron filings do because every material interacts with electrostatics differently than it does with gravity because electrostatics does not explain the downward bias. But I would like to share 
uh, my screen and, and go to another topic unless you want to continue on to this, um, Shane. No, you can go, man. Okay. Um, yeah. Hey, sure. Let's see. Let's see. Um, yes. Man, everyone. this is like. Oz is killing it. Hell yeah. No, I'm like all messed up. Okay. So I want to talk about quantized light. Do you believe um, light needs a medium to travel in? Ooh. Oh, I muted him. I thought you were going to go. You need some ether wind. Yeah, I can't right. get my thing. And I, my, and Should right, you? I can't even exit my PowerPoint. Okay, good. I, I pressed the wrong button. That, I'll just ask the question. I'll get it set up. Do you believe light needs a, um, a medium to travel in? Yes. Okay. Um, why is that the case? <laughs> well, how can anything propagate through nothing? How can a wave through it? it wave, a wave is you can't hand someone a wave, right? To have a wave, it has to. What is waving? It's going. Through is it a wave or a particle or makes, both? What uh, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> so, are we talking about how they uh, change the the law, the Ampere's law, to allow infinite perpetuity or reification, where the electric static field would reinforce the magnetic field, and the magnetic field would reinforce the electric field, and they would sort of perpetuate each other to infinitum to replace the energetic background that was before. Um, no, I, my understanding of light is that it can act like a particle at times. So light itself does not actually need a medium to um, travel because it can act as a particle. You could consider the vacuum of space to be a medium, I guess, like a field or of some type, if you want to, if you want to reify it as such. Well, so in Maxwell change Ampere's law, right, which was the literal based on how he means would ampere's perpetuate law. themselves. They needed a background, but now they don't because they invented something called what was it? The displacement current, which is not real, and then just does not exist. That justifies this self-perpetuating electromagnetic perpetuity nonsense thing that allows things in electromagnetic fields, particularly, to exist without a medium, which is just nonsense, right? Of course, they need a, a medium. They, it's a hide the need. The energy it's the hide the need for an energetic background. Why the Ampere's law was changed in the first place, and why it was mathematically obscured. Mathematics. Yeah, I'm not familiar with um, Ampere's law. If you want to go into it, go ahead. Uh, let's see. So, I mean, we're talking you, about electron flow. So, well, I just mentioned that I thought you were screen, talking about does, how you know Maxwell how the fixed, share, or, quote, fixed I guess he just doesn't want people to secure a law, which was a, no, involving that, he the perpetuation of electromagnetic really and a. a electrostatic and magnetic fields but you always require that it's kind of a strategy though because so he doesn't want to waste time maybe. to no longer require that medium they just said that because of this force that they invented on the spot that what well, again claire admittedly wasn't real called the displacement current that now they don't need that background medium and now electromagnetic fields can uh, perpetuate magnetic fields and magnetic fields can perpetuate electro uh, electric fields in in per perpetuity for nothing through nothing forever which is weird because we know it needs a background, but you were going to say it doesn't You're need a background? You're just saying stuff. No, I, I don't know if it does need a background. I just don't think we can prove that there is any type of background medium. So like the concept of an ether or something like that, I don't think is a falsifiable claim. Um, and we can see like light travel through um, vacuums as, as close to a vacuum as we can get. So if you want to see like there's quantum fields or something that light must propagate through, through some type of quantum um, theory of reality and reify that as like the ether, like some physicists have attempted to do in the past, I guess you can do so. But as far as I understand it, light can be quantized and I, I can share like where we can see that light can be quantized. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I I have that up now. Yes, uh, we did got schooled by Nathan Thompson on this. I think being stupid thing. I have too you many gotta, you're um, good now. You're big things. Sure. All right, here we go. And this is from Nathan Nathan Oakley's channel. So the double slit is running right here, right? He's got a camera oh, yeah, on his detector yeah. and he's projecting it on his computer screen. So what's happening when this light is going through the double slit? It's hitting the detector. You see these little dots, right? That's where the light is hitting the detector. And if you keep on going, you see how there's more little dots. That's little chunks of energy and momenta hitting the photographic plate. Well, what are little chunks of energy and momenta? They're called particles. 
Yeah, so the concept there is that light can be travel at, let me stop sharing my screen, is that light can travel as particles. Because we you can agree? empiricize it? No. <laughs> we have a different framework of interpretation for the same phenomenon that we're witnessing and then trying to understand and interpret, right? Very differently, we can interpret that according to our framework for interpretation. So to say that I don't believe that it's particles, well, no. Uh, I don't think that light can be simultaneously two things, depending on how you think about it. It is a wave, and it's only mistaken for particles because of the misunderstanding of the way it propagates, right? The photon, for yum, instance, yum, yum. instead of being little tiniest quantifiable little bit of light that pops in little balls of light and go in perpetuity until you can receive them to see them, like, ooh, that's act would be more sensically as a an event, an intercedence of the electric and the magnetic fields. And when that intercedes, you have light, luminosity. And because of that, you have an event, which would be called a photon. The same thing, experienced the same way, but interpreted very differently between the frameworks of interpretation. So is light a particle? No, absolutely not. It needs a wave. It needs a background to wave through. Because when we were talking about frequency with uh, Planck's constant, right, I think was the... Uh, the quantification of the lowest amount of energy that can exist in one second, it requires a medium as well. And you need, let's see, if you introduce heat, then waves actually never collapse and turn into particles. There's only measure the waves, which is the diffraction pattern. So what was the evidence for particles again? Um, that life is particles where you can see it quantized in a double split experiment. I think we have other evidence for um that like we have um, forward-looking infrared, we have radar, the, the concept where we can measure the round trip speed of light, right? Where light does um, take 12.36 microseconds to, to travel I told one you. nautical mile in return. Do you, do you agree that it takes 12.36 microseconds for light to travel a nautical mile and return for radar to work? Well, I don't want to get into sky miles versus statue miles, et cetera, yet. But let's, uh, I mean, I on the quantification of the induction rate of light, I mean, that's a thing that's useful, sure. We know it's useful because satellites work with their good old C plus V. That wouldn't be the case, right? So we know that it's a quantifiable, measurable thing. It's if we quantify <laughs> the rate of induction or the tra time it takes to travel would be, you know, identical so yeah i could think that that's a quantifiable metric and a useful measurement but is it really light traveling at one hundred eighty-six thousand miles per hour probably not well what's traveling then well nothing is traveling what if it's already there so if it's in a medium then all you're seeing <laughs> is the time it takes for you to <laughs> the luminosity to reach you which would if it's in a field already, just that be quantifying the rate of induction for you know, electromagnetic field to have luminosity, right? Because if the light is electromagnetic radiation or itself, right, EMF, then, of course, you're just going to have a rate of induction that is, of course, quantifiable constantly and usually the same. So that itself can be metrically and mathematically useful, right? Yeah, travel. Right? Are you saying we don't perceive the light um, at, for that speed, like 12.36 microseconds per Round trip, one nautical mile, two nautical miles. <laughs> is that that is the math? That is correct. Yeah. Does that come out to the one hundred eighty-six thousand miles per hour? Or whatever? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. it's for radar. We use um, radar range miles. Is twelve point three six microseconds is one radar range mile. Boom! Hit him with knowledge. Do, do, do. So we are able to send a <laughs> radar signal out. It goes one nautical mile and returns back to the receiver for the sensor to sense it. We take that time signal from when we transmit the signal until we receive it. What are they receiving if it's not the electromagnetic um, radiation they send it out? You should have just let be, them kill us time, though. Wouldn't but that, that be that, a actual? So when it gets that. sent out in very low frequency in radio F, so it wouldn't an east to west differential be more pronounced than a north south differential because it also obeys the uh, directional preferential speed of light that we have so if we're radio waves inducing then east to west would be slightly slower and faster going east or west right um well both objects are moving it really doesn't matter for the distances most aircraft like the the radar is only good for 35 <laughs> nautical miles so it doesn't really matter um, for that type of um, testing. So my question is, what is the detector uh, receiving if it's not the EMF? 
But I think it is, man. I think that we've just okay. the, the phenomenon that we're quantifying as a speed of light. I've just said is the thing that I accept, but explain differently and interpret, you know, according to my framework, which doesn't mean I don't acknowledge it. I just think about it differently, right? Sure, it's a useful metric, but I don't think it's the time it takes for light to travel. I think it's the time it takes for the electromagnetic induction to be luminescent. And I think, I think, I it's think, a small nitpicky thing, but it only difference is it doesn't travel. So how do you know there's a difference between light and EMF? How do you know there's a difference? So like you can't see EMF, but you can see light. Right. Well, we get to what the fundamental mix up of everything is a different, a different question, right? If everything is like, so is like hard light matter <laughs> is light. All there is, is electromagnetic forces, the ether under torsion and the electro or the electrostatic ether under torsion and the electromagnetism ether under stress etc or <laughs> do the fundamental forces that we know all exist as a equilibrium seeking device of causal pressure <laughs> mediation right well, that's why i'm pressure. asking well and i'll just say real quick okay. let me interject you can stop the clock for a second uh more than because i keep getting the questions right the questions but you're supposed to be presenting something and he's presenting something and you're just asking him questions the whole time so try and get to your point you're needing to pre prove to us sure gravity oh. and he's going to try and prove the other but don't just ask him questions all the time jaren to anyway, the rescue yeah i, no, yeah, I know those, about I the think topic of gravity but um i can go back into the I think you're saying um, those in that then, though. um cavendish experiment so do you agree like i don't think you're able to um show that um, your experiment with the Van de Graaff generator is showing any downward bias because you're still appealing to the density difference between different things to explain why things fall down, even though density is not exp give, explaining the bias. But any, anyways, Cavendish experiment, we do have the independent variable um, in the experiment, which is the distance between the masses. The Van de variable would be the force that we measure with the torsion bar. The control variables are the masses that we actually use, the torsion wire and the experimental conditions. Uh, the torsion um, indicates a horizontal gravitational force isolated from Earth's gravity. And then we have the formula that we can calculate for the gravitational constant. What's wrong with that test? Oh, do so do much. Do can I share screen? Yep. Go ahead. <laughs> My dog is gonna go crazy here. He's growling. Can you chill? Give me a minute. I guess sharing the screen takes longer. I don't know if you meant to do that. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Just making sure he doesn't freak out. There it is. <laughs> you felt it coming. <laughs> Okay, yeah, you, you are sharing now. Go ahead. You, you still need a second? We can give you a second if you need. Oh. Yes, I definitely need a second. His girlfriend's out there, so he's going to yip for about two minutes straight and nothing I could do. <laughs> no problem. We'll give you a second. Uh, Ozian, what do you want to talk about? Well, let me make sure uh, the clocks are stopped. Uh, we are good. Okay. Okay. How'd you like uh, the solar eclipse yesterday? I thought it was Did boring. It? Yeah, it does boring, it's but boring. It is sort of boring. Yeah, I take my camera out there. I got the yeah. infrared, and I what probably watched. What do you mean boring? It was awesome. In, like, I saw it though. Like, Ten percent. It was great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> I'm gonna go watch paint dry. It seems to be about just as fun. <laughs> Not ah. out there to stream. Did you? I did you? I got the like a 360 um, sunrise sunset um, around me. Pretty cool. What do you mean? Oh, you saw you you filmed that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice. I streamed it actually. It's pretty cool. Where were you where are you at? Um Erie, Pennsylvania. Okay. So not is that was that in the path, the full path? Yeah. Totality? So really? the the clouds went away like twenty minutes before um the eclipse. Like so I got there. Like I didn't think we would get clear skies because it's cloudy overcast the whole time. There was no ships. I was gonna get some horizon footage but i couldn't get any because ah there was no ships unfortunately it's because you work for nasa that i think that they remove the clouds right in time for you. yeah nice well, I'm, a, I'm a jewish um, um yeah, cgi yeah. 
All right. Yeah. Finesse and catching a show check are different, right? Our dome <laughs> has CGI. <laughs> you back, Shane? <laughs> I think I'm good. I think he's. I think we're past it. Yeah. Okay, you're sharing so, screens, and we will start your clock. Good. Cool. Good to go. So you went over the Cavendish mass attracting attracting mass. So essentially, right? We can set it so that the gravitational force within the Newton's law of universal gravitation cancels itself out. Mass literally algebraically cancels when we derive Newton's law or the the Kepler's law from Newton's law, essentially. When we do that, right, we just retain the periodicity in the same description of the ellipse of the event. Essentially, the sky path of the celestial objects can be described perfectly without mass, but Newton no, insisted on inserting it, but we can remove it kinematically, therefore proving it couldn't possibly be a dynamic cause or force of gravity. Now, again, dynamic and kinematics are different. Dynamic would be the prediction of real life forces and emotion and body, and kinematics would be <laughs> the mathematical description of things that you can change. Just poof on a piece on, on paper, essentially, right? So if we can remove it kinematically, it wasn't a dynamic force, period, full stop. So if it wasn't a dynamic force of the causal nature of the path of the planets, then what was it? Oh, wait. So if we can determine the mass of celestial bodies using this famous equation that we then derived from Kepler, then what we have people is a way to mathematically covariantly scale a whole building universe based on optics that is diameter of celestial objects so if we take say the uh the, the degree the apparent diameter of the sun and the moon as jaron pointed out in his scaling covariant video then they can say that that's a different mass and distance all the way through with factorially going down and using that method <laughs> they would covariantly build massive relationships of distance and solar systems galaxies etc all the way through based on this Chem, this mathematical derivation of mass. However, when we can remove mass from it, how are they describing the mass of celestial objects with the literal kinematic derivation of nothing dynamically causing, causing nothing? But it gets worse, right? Because we determine the strength of gravity as, of course, the inverse relationship of mass we went over, but we like to compare it to uh, Newton, as we said before, the comparison of Newton's law of gravitation and Coulomb's law of the charges is the absolute best way to take a look at what we're really talking about, right? This thing right here, because what the differences are are so little <laughs> that it's ridiculous. If it's almost like if you took one law to make a new law, you know, dynamically say uh, mass, Newton, gravity, and Kepler's description of orbital periodicity, then they would be equivalent in all the ways except for the one where you wanted to change it, right? So now if we're saying mass, of course it has an inverse relationship to mass. So we can remove kinematically, uh, dynamically, the mass attracting mass from Newton's law of gravitation. So that is null and void. That's just a description of the orbital periodicity. Of course, the derivations from there would be null and void as well. And we can also use the same equivalence with uh, Collins' law and the universal law of gravitation. And again, the constants would also be derived similarly and come out, not identically, but definitely equivalently. I think that's good. <laughs> I was in your all right, that's great. But now you're just appealing to um, electrical equivalent for mechanical explanations. Oh. So then it goes back to my explanation for why ex electrostatics doesn't explain why things fall down. If you're seeing a kinematical equivalence for Coulomb's Y explains the downward accelerations, then we're right back to electrostatics not explaining why things fall down. And you're also straw manning what I explained by with the um, Cavendish experiment, which had nothing to do with orbital mechanics. The Cavendish experiments is about putting two masses um, side by side and showing that they attract to each other. Has nothing to do with the gravity towards the earth, even though the gravity towards the earth does have an effect on the whole apparatus at all, but we isolate the, that gravitational force between the gravitational force between the two masses and with the new technology, new equipments we have today, we can remove a lot of these other forces and stuff like that to isolate as much as possible to the gravitational force. Are there problems? Of course there's problems because we are not in a fixed absolute space of, we don't have a lab reference that is fixed. That's a problem we have with all these tests that we haven't gone into with SAGNAC effect and all these other stuff. When you talk about Wang, Ruyang, we don't have a fixed lab frame. We can never have probably have a fixed lab frame or know if we could ever have a fixed lab frame. So any claimed to any type of movement, we have to take into account that we cannot know if we're fixed or not because the earth itself, as far as we know, is rotating. So the, your entire thing you went on to 
was about orbital mechanics, but I was talking about the Cavendish experiment, which is two parallel things attracting to each other. So anybody can do the test. And people can go online and look at very accurate tests where we actually use gold, like very, very accurate tests. So why why can't you address the Cavendish experiment directly? And if you're appealing to Coulomb's law, then you're right back to electrostatics. You've refuted your whole electrostatics claim. And 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 my argument to explain that it doesn't provide enough force holds true. Yes. The only thing well, missing from that was your mom. No, right. So if you want to stick to the derivation of the gravitational constant in Newton's, we could do that, right? There's a nice paper that someone put out for the gravitational force in unit relativity literally applied to flat earth, but they kept it with the radius of the flat earth, which is obviously kind of a equivalent nonsensical, but mathematically it works, right? So you can say that the gravitational force, when you can start with Newton's law of gravitation and derive the same constant 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th in force of Newton's, but then you can say redefining it as the force of his column bolt meters, G1 M1 over R squared, the same periodicity again, and then you have the M1, the supposed mass of flat Earth. Again, this is not my position, just a different way to do what you're saying can't be done. When it's actually from a paper called Spears, but uh, they do gravitational force to the round earth and they get this equivalent G derivation, kind of a, the same kinematic equivalently. So they do ME times 5.972 times 10 to the 24 kilograms acceleration due to gravity A, of course, back to that G versus A. And then they take the 9.8 meters per second squared backwards deriving it to get 10 to negative 11 volt meters i think per kilogram and then that of course would equivalently be 9.8 meters per second squared that's just one way to do it but there's a much better way from a paper that honestly i don't fully understand because it's the upper level of electromagnetic oh. the the thesis right the electromagnetic nature of gravitation and matter antimatter and anti-gravity the surmise on quantum vacuum gravitation and cosmology i think you've seen this before but this is one of the better ones where literally they derive the gravitational constant using Planck's length the permeability and the permissibility constants did literally the mathematical descriptions of the electric in the energetic field and they use the mass charge equivalents and electromagnetic nature of gravitation of the constant g again using coulomb's electrostatics and newton's law of gravitation to derive the force of newton so like what they get is literally by using the uh electrostatic theory and the permeability permissibility electrostatic law and then the description of the charge potential for particles he derives literally the constant g to a degree of like four decibels using just the electromagnetic force in that constant so this is a pretty cool formula i think where he uses you know like i said plank lengths in the elementary charge and then he has awesome equivalents down at the bottom where he literally uh, let's see, using the particles and antiparticles with masses and charges, they separate it by distance. Again, a kinematic derivation of periodicity analogous to the electrostatic potential density per ratio. And then you have the gravitational potential U Newton. Again, this paper is epic, but it's another way to derive what you said you couldn't be done. So what we were originally starting with was a generalization of these hyper-specific examples where we could say generally the vector is determined electromagnetically, electrostatically, and the general work of what you call G is uh, the buoyant density, uh, natural combination of forces. Okay, then you're just obfuscating by showing these equivalencies. They have nothing to do with your worldview um, to explain the downward acceleration. So Coulomb's law has nothing to do with this. So you can't say um uh, they're equivalent um you you have another explanation because we cannot take electrical force and explain why mass attracts mass so yes these formulas um are similar because the concepts are similar when it comes to forces and distances between the two objects that are uh, providing the forces it seems to be something that's sort of fundamental about um what um inverse square law about forces and stuff and how they propagate through our reality maybe that's something that's sort of fundamental i don't know that's sort of a philosophical concept i'm not really um familiar with but it still doesn't go uh explain why we can take two masses and masses are just arbitrary things right that we we've decided 
um, that one cubic centimeter of water at four degrees Celsius is one gram. We can take these masses, put them next to each other, and see that we cause a force of attraction towards each other based on gold. Like, no, like magnetism, uh, elect electrostatic forces, just the masses themselves attract to each other. And that seems to explain our observations. Now, with that being said, if you're, if you're appealing to all these forces that explain why things fall down and why these densities do the things they do, then it seems like you're appealing to forces that would produce a sphere and a globe. So why, if you're appealing to these forces being true, do you deny that the Earth is a globe? Or is, unless you want to respond to my claim with the Cavendish experiments. Cavendish, right? So there's a direct refutation to Cavendish published in the form of a paper where he literally derives the same constant electrostatically, poor proving and that electrostatics can't officially be eliminated as a cause of whatever attraction you claim to measure and attribute to this mystical math, mass attracting mass that's never been observed and hasn't been anything but mathematically uh, essentially contrived, right? And then what he does is he, again, another equivalent, derives the so-called gravitational constant using just the electromagnetic force again, and he derives it in coulomb volt meters per kilogram again, the F2 is FG equals G over ME times M over R squared. It's similar, but uses the ma the supposed mass of the Earth because you need the mass of the object and the radiance, the radius, the distance to the center of Earth, right? So that's the one that I said is the, on the flat Earth site. But that essentially mathematically takes the Cavendish and shits all over it with a whole bunch of electrostatic equivalents that says, hey, we can do the same thing electrostatically. So even in the crazy fantasy world that mass does attract mass, is it gravity or is it electrostatics? It hasn't been proven. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Okay. So like the Cavendish experience, electrostatics can't explain why mass attracts mass because as you understand it, if, everybody, if everything has the same electro potential, like uh, equal potential zone, which they are because they're all connected to each other through the torsion wires, through the torsion bar. All the things are all grounded together. So they're all considered ground potential. There's no voltage difference. There's no potential for electrostatics or electromagnetics mm -hmm. to um, connect to each other. And they put them in Faraday cages, as I showed in the video that I put on the screen earlier. They have it in a Faraday cage. So electrostatics, electromagnet, electromagnetism does not explain why these two masses are attracted to each other because they are being removed from the equation. Now, you can see there might be just a hair smidgen, but you're just appealing to electromagnetism, electrostatics, creating a downward bias and buoyancy explaining all the other stuff. So why, if it's a, why are they attracted sideways? If electrostatics is just about downward bias and it's not the force of attraction, some reason, if it is a force of attraction, then I've refuted electrostatics as reports of refraction in my video. If it is, if it's not, if it's just downward bias, then <laughs> explain the Cavendish experiment. Sure. So you went to the Cavendish, but we did start, right, with the basis for the Cavendish, which was Newton's law of the celestial orbital bodies. That is the whole causal mechanism, the starting point, the basis, and the origin of mass attracting mass as a causal mechanism for supposed gravity. Gravity came from the sky, came from Newton taking Kepler's observations and kinematically inserting mass. That's where it came from. So to go to the Cavendish and then say refute it, it's like, well, it's you know like when you play Jenga and there's like a top block and that's like the top block and what we did was kick out the bottom of the tower and the whole thing sort of fell fell over with the kinematic but there's no need for a Cavendish experiment when there's no basis for assuming or assuming that mass attracts mass in the first place because we you know debunked that necessity for the description of the orbital periodicity but we also like I said can't eliminate the force of electrostatics so when they had the two lead balls specifically 
right? If every material is inherently electrostatic and can't be removed, then any inherent charge could distort measurements or say charge induction. The mere proximity of one to the other could induce a charge leading to attraction or repulsion as we went over before, even if one remains neutral, even if it's grounded. You could also have Earth's electric field, which again, we need to differentiate the difference between how charge things act around each other and how things exist within an electrostatic gradient or field like we do on Earth. Those are very different. And in regards to the Cavendish, we have the effects of Earth's electric field, say, on this uh, measurement of mass attracting mass. If the lead spheres bore even a minute charge, the electric field together would have influenced them, potentially interfering with the supposed gravitational measurements. Then you have the relative magnitude of forces being compared, neglecting to account for minor electrostatic interactions that would always produce misleading results. Then, of course, you have the actual environmental atmospheric daily rotating factors that can also change. So, I mean, that's one very specific refutation to the basis, foundation, and conclusions of Cavendish. But we don't really care about Cavendish because that's all nonsense, right? They replaced that when Nicholson Morley failed to detect the motion of the Earth and they had to invent the mathematical framework which inverted the world around them to say that actually they did detect it, but we'll just covariantly transform you back to a coordinate set that isn't prime and that not lab frame where you can exist and pretend to live. Yeah, I, I understand the problem with lab frames that we don't have an absolute lab frame because as as um oh what's his name face said mock said it would be what like abhorrent like it would be the worst thing ever to pretend like there's an absolute lab frame lab absolute frame of reference but so I sort of deny that that's even a coherent concept that we could even know if we're moving or not so I I don't appeal to that. I'm not appealing to orbital mechanics. I'm appealing to the concept that this this thing that we call mass attracts the mass. So once again, I, I think you sort of ignored it. And I'll go back to my original argument that if electrostatics just is downward bias, then um, things attracting sideways is not explained by electrostatics. It must be explained by mass attracting mass okay so if, if it is if it's electrostatics they're all going to have the same charge so if anything they're going to repel each other and not be attracted to each other because they're going to all have the same equipotential charge so they would be repelling from each other not attracted to each other but they are attracted to each other and it doesn't matter what the electrostatic charge is on the devices. They're all within a certain range of charges, a certain range of attraction. So you should be able to affect the electrostatic charge to change what the gravitational constant is. Sounds like a good test. You guys should do that and, and see if it is the electrostatic charge is causing it or not. And you should be able to isolate for that and see if that's what it is that's causing mass to attract mass and not the actual mass doing the thing is some type of electrostatic charge. Now we can isolate for electrostatic charge. So either it's downward bias or it's the attractive force causing things to fall or mass to attract mass. If it's what's causing mass to attract mass, electrostatic forces, then there is not enough force in the electro, the, the voltage gradient of the atmosphere. Voltage is not work. Voltage cannot do work. Watts. Do work. You need watts to do work. 400 kilovolts, like you appeal to the coulombs, does not do work. You need power flow. You need power to do work. Volts is not power. You need watts or VA or whatever. If anything, the atmosphere has a 24 hertz signal, which means it's like this, which means there's no preferred direction because the flow is actually with the atmosphere is normally is from the Earth up to the atmosphere, regardless of what Feynman says in the lecture from positive to the ground, that the flow of that 10 micro microamps is actually neither direction because it's oscillating, it's 24 hertz, it's like this, it's a waveform, so it doesn't have a direction. It's just like this. But um, where does this electrostatic charge come from? Um, do you know? Where does the electrostatic charge come from? You mean the description of the charge potential outlined in the equation for Coulomb's law for comparative uh, reasoning to the Newton's law of gravitation? Or like, where does it come from, like metaphysically? Yeah, where does it come from for the Earth? Where's this 400 
thousand volt for charge for the earth come from where where does it come from earth's magnetic field where does it come from well we know it doesn't come from the earth's geocenter with magma rolling producing metal that's a magnetic field past the curie point we also know it's not through the intercore of the outer mantle of a convection current introducing itself all the way through in a non-analogous non-uniform bipolar northern heavy non-symmetrical way but it does seem to come from the center and emanate outwards and have this nice concentric pattern matching, you know, the solar and lunar maximum, the measurement of interferometry, the different speed of light east to west, and the different interaction of satellites, how C plus V finds the range measurement equation perfectly accurate, always accounting for the invariant speed of light with that pesky east-west direction. And I feel like I got lost a second there. Where, where, where's, the where, where's the power come from? Like, you, right. do, you, do you agree? Like the first and second law of thermodynamics, just the general principles. Like you can't create energy and matter. Um, where's the power come from for this um, electrostatics? Power. So, like again, we're trying to equivocate this to doing the work for gravity. Like one for one transfer isn't going to work, right? We need a better description of what, say force and work is right so we only have work defined as what what's the definition for work in physics uh, the ability to do something right yes i remember being a very ridiculous explanation that didn't describe anything when i first learned it i was like that's nothing cool right right, right. I'm that, that that's what it was so like that's broadly vaguely defined what we need to do is how the force would not be gravity it would be a you know, density, buoyancy, relative oh, gradient, which would also involve the electric potential of denser masses proportionally. So, yeah, essentially, we're back on the Cavendish, but have you seen Cavendish replicated? How come they aren't doing, like, say, a Disney mountain size Cavendish <laughs> on Earth? How come they can't say that that mountain pulls the other mountain also, how come all the geopotential gravitational influences attributed to this in terms of geodesic uh, surveying always time to happen at the same time they try to match measurements to Earth is bigger than the mountain. But it's that it's easy. the only time the gravitational yeah. influence pulled the plumb bob off on that geoidal uh, reference plate. But that's a little side note. If we go back to the Cavendish as the de facto not needed mass attracting mass non-conclusive quote experiment, <laughs> we don't need it because the causal mechanism of Newton's observation of periodicity of the sky didn't mean anything. And we just equivocate it for what it is today, right? As the actual observation of a periodicity. But the force itself is one of the fundamental forces, right? If we say that everything is seeking equilibrium, which results in gradations of pressure mediation, then that pressure mediation takes forms. And electromagnetism, electrostatics, the fundamental forces of nature are those forms. Yeah, I would argue that uh, we do other tests for gravity nowadays. There's tons of other tests for gravity we do other day nowadays. Uh, I, I think there's a, a mountain that's so like perfectly shaped that they can actually use a pendulum and it will um, swing further towards the mountain when it's closer to the mountain than it would if it was further away from the mountain. So it is being attracted towards the mountain. It's pretty cool. I, that's why I heard it. I looked it up. So take it for what it is. Um, um, I lost a total brain fart. Don't you hate that, Shane? Happens, like, right? I'm like, hey, I forgot what I was talking about mid sentence. My bad. <laughs> it's Kim Trails. Yeah, it's Shane Trail. I, the, Contrails. Uh, it's my time. I'll just say, it anyways, I, I'm like seven minutes ahead, so I can waste a few minutes. Um, there was a, a plane when I was watching the eclipse yesterday that did uh, um, a circle around the solar eclipse. Um, so he put a big, huge circle chemtrail. It was a chemtrail. Just did a big circle around the eclipse. So I, it, it's a, if you go look at my video on Matters Now, it's the thumbnail for the video where he put, put a big, huge circle around the sun. It's pretty cool. So right for us there at the lake. Or at the Lake Erie. Okay. Um, we'll stop the anyway, clock real quick. So I just wanted to just say that uh, if, if we get closer to the... Oh, let me stop the clock here for you. There you go. Um, there we go. Just if people want to get the questions in, get them in for Super Chats or Rockfin Tips, 
And yeah, hopefully you guys are. Uh, the super chats are going to be wild. I've been monitoring the chat on, on Jaren's channel. The questions are going to be insane. You shouldn't LJ's, even notice that we're really LJ's having LJ's questions. The next no. They're, they're doing well by themselves. No, right, I'm uh, Go ahead. Ozan, you, can, you were about to say something. Oh, yeah. Wits it too. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, earlier you appealed to the four fundamental forces. I don't know if you misspoke. Um, one of them is gravity. I, I just, <laughs> somebody's going to call me out if I don't pin you on that. But um, did you mean something else besides gravity? Nope. Nope. Fully aware. Like, you know, you got to work within the framework of your opponent to have a chance of connecting or conveying an idea, right? So that it would be the four fundamental forces we were all raised with. Now I just have a slightly interpretation of one, right? Slightly different interpretation. All right. I think I remember my train of thought. I'm intentionally not appealing to concepts like theory of relativity um uh, because like the idea of the cavendish experiment is pretty easy for people to go test and there are more modern tests that people that have been done um you can go check them out there's um tests where they isolate as, as many parameters as possible they use lasers and stuff that point and if you watch the video where i showed the Feynman lecture on the cavendish experiment um if on the side you can see um, where one of the schools is actually using a machine to do the Cavendish experiment with a laser and a, a little um, timer <clears throat> where they're um, measuring the torsion bar swing so they can calculate the the C, where they're actually calculating the force and then they can take the force and go back and calculate the, the constant, um, gravitational constant, and then they can apply that to Earth. So that's what they do. It's pretty cool. Um, so why, if all these forces are, are true, where you believe that, um, um, everything's finding like equilibrium, all these, uh, masses are finding equilibrium due to density and stuff like that. Wouldn't it be the case that it would form into a shape of a sphere? Why? Why do you think that? Why do people think that? <laughs> accretion is a made-up thing to go along with gravitational evolution and scientific backing right when dust attracts other dust to form a particle a bigger particle to get a sphere that's the portion of a gravity accretion making sphericity that's never really happened right that's explained a kid that came along to explain the first thing why why would we think that that would make a sphere well I believe we've been to space. I accept it's true that we've been to the moon. The moon's a, a sphere, basically a sphere. We have pictures of the Earth. The Earth is a sphere. We've we've gone to Mars. Mars is a sphere. We've gone to the moon. The moon's a sphere. We sent a probe that's left the heliosphere. If you're familiar with that concept, it's gone outside of the solar system. Two of them have. Um, so like the, it looks like everything's a sphere. So we have explanations for that using gravity. Are there problems with theory of relativity? I believe there are. Like we've we haven't solved all the field equations. Like I think there's a couple that we've come to solutions with. They take supercomputers just to come to approximations. Like there, so like there's problems, and we don't have an absolute reference frame to even measure speed of light. Right. So, um, but the Cavendish experiments, mass attracts mass. We can measure on Earth. Right, you're frozen, or uh -huh. am I frozen? Uh, stop the clock real quick. We'll figure out where he went. Nope. He, yeah, we can go. measure electrostatics. Uh, so he bunked. Dang it, he won by default. This is how I was going to say the same thing right now. He's going to make a vote. For I know. Uh, well, with your audience, nope. you know nice the the polls. That was someone in Jared's won. chat that oh, that theory. Damn, someone must have disconnected him. That the must have been NASA. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, good. I was trying to get you fixed, but I have the opportunity okay. to win then. You have a chance again. Okay. I have a chance. Uh, who is talking? Shane. I, I put it up to on him, but I don't think he heard me. Probably not. He was gone about three seconds before that. Did you hear me, Shane? He back up. He's muted. What uh, the hell was that? I don't know. You, <laughs> you, got, you froze and then got booted. I froze? Oh, I thought it was you. Okay, all right. No, it was you. We're still here. Uh, but did you hear what Ozian had asked you right before that? I heard most of that. Not the end. <laughs> Want to try and complete it? 
Ozian. <laughs> Dude, I'm like 50 years old. And, and um, I have a know, question I've for had... you, though. One thing that bothers me. How come it's Oz, but Ozian? They can't, you can't do that to people. It's either Ozian, Ozian or Oz. Ozian, yeah. Can't, you, can't, you don't get to shorten your name to something that doesn't have the same sound as the original. Well, it's easier for people to say Oz. Well, it wasn't last week. You, I, I tried. I called you Ozian, and then you're like, no, it's Ozian. I'm like, oh, okay. And then later, I don't or care call if me Oz. Say Other people <laughs> might correct you. I okay. don't typically correct people. Nobody corrects me. Come on. All right. Um, just to rethink about where you want to start from there and go ahead. We were talking about um, that I don't appeal to gravity because... I don't appeal to theory of relativity because we have problems with absolute frames of reference. We can't know if we have an absolute frame of reference and we probably can't um, have one. Um, and so we can't measure like uh, be absolutely certain speed of light, stuff like that. But we can measure gravity attracts ma uh, mass attracts mass with the Cavendish experiment. That's why I appeal to do that. But you can't. Right. It's never it's never <laughs> it's not used in anything. It's just a based off a sky observation that is mathematically disproven. And they have different instances of Cavendish that goes all the way through the variables that literally can't be eliminated. So if we have a Where? experiment that judges that we've eliminated all other forces, therefore, what is left must be the supposed gravitational, but then doesn't eliminate all the other forces, let alone a derivation of the fundamental force that runs the world. How would they then professionally claim actually this is definitely mass attracting mass? You can say that it is, but mathematically, Coulomb's law and the charge potential the equation is identical to the mass uh, attracting mass equation, which isn't needed, right? You can use the same description of that without mass. Literally, the only way you can get mass of the sky is this equation based on Kepler, which is, again, kinematically derived with the massing mass canceling out so the way that they get the mass of any object in space is again optic measurements over diameter and degrees based on this equation they then say well the mass attracting mass of the newton's law of gravitation means it's this big and this this attractive force this many newtons of, yeah. of gravitational force without this equation that again uh, newton poofed out of nothing right where he invented calculus swapped the kinematic for a dynamic did a little back end pop right out, right? So once you did this, then they could use this as the fundamental building block for the heliocentric lore that everyone kind of fell for. So Cavendish is one of the biggest and the easiest ones to debunk, destroy, besmirch, discredit, and or otherwise, you know, fundamentally uh, obliterate, right? <laughs> oh, he knows a few pseudonyms. Ooh. Yeah, I'm not a heliocentrist either. I, I don't believe we can know what the center of anything is uh, because we don't know if anything's not moving um, because I don't think we can have a fixed uh, lab frame or know if a lab frame is fixed, including the sun. So people who say I ought to argue that the sun is fixed, I think, are absurd. Um, we cannot know that the sun is fixed. Um, you can't know if the sun is fixed. You can't know if the earth is fixed. I still want to know um, why it wouldn't form a sphere. I don't think you accurately explained why it wouldn't form a sphere, but th that's really not the shape or, or the argument. And I still don't know how you can use these equivalencies um, between the equation. Just because two equations um, appear to be equivalent doesn't mean they're describing the same forces. Coulomb's law is a, a describing electrical forces. Um, gravity uh, is describing gravitational forces. Now, all, all these forces describe a specific thing. They are not equivalent forces. They do. They can have the potential to do work within their own thing. So you have. You can do mechanical work. You can do electrical work. Um, so is there anything else? I don't know. Maybe there is. Um, yeah, buoyancy, right? So relative density. Well, that's due with gravity. Even if your own model, you can't refute gravity. Like, how do you refute um, buoyancy? Like, explain buoyancy. Sure. Like, did, show me the math. It's a, the math must be the same. You you even showed it to me with Coulomb's law. He's going to say to replace the G with the A. Uh, yeah, let's I'll do that. Okay. Can we share something again? Yep. There we go. Share that. Cool. You're good. 
So again, we're just using kinematic equivalencies to not have to rely on the G as a you know mystic force of unexplained gravitation or whatever. It's just the accepted average, right? We don't discount that things appear to fall at 9.8 meters a second squared varying by latitude. We just disagree with the causal mechanism that hasn't otherwise been proved. So when we use kinematics, we do it like this, where we dis we algebraically redefine the law so that the thing that we're deriving is not a constant and then the thing that we need can be algebraically solved the same thing we did for gravity right when we said height is just half of acceleration over time squared plus velocity over the time which is just the algebraic the derivation of acceleration equals two times the height over the time squared which is usually going to give you g on a relative on earth system right but we use that to go through the other derivations of, of basic formula of buoyancy doesn't need g of course not all it is is the of the, course the displacement the volume of the displacement the acceleration which we just kinematically derive from height equals what have over, over t squared and then we have the the point force itself is described just with the density the acceleration and the volume it's super easy we also do mass f equals ma weight f equals or weight w equals ma of course density p equals m over v and then the good old f equals mg which we have this awesome meme, which will turn into an actual mathematic equivalence with weight, mass, and G, which again, A, A gives a kinematic equivalent and accepted for all purposes. So then you have back to the electrostatic explanation using all of these forces cohesively together without invoking the relative non-defined constant G, but just using kinematics, observations, uh, acceleration, and physics to you know determine the same thing. So is, is gravity necessary for any of this is the question. Absolutely not is the answer. Sorry. Oh, we have a field equations too, but that's different. I I didn't see electrostatics anywhere in those equations, and I don't see how much force electrostatics apply, and how much electrostatics it would take to cause things to levitate. I didn't see that anywhere in that equation. We know in a Van de Graaff's generator we can cause things to levitate. Where is that in your equation for buoyancy? Where is the electrostatics, the voltage in your equation for buoyancy? Where is it at? You want me to define the equation that would describe the gradient density ratio that we were talking about before to get things to float once you overcome the charge potential? Is that what yeah, I didn't see. I don't see electrostatics in your formula for buoyancy. It was not. No, that was just the acceleration, the volume displacement, and you know the whatever else I said. Let's see. <laughs> yeah. Literally, displacement, acceleration, volume. That, that's all buoyancy is. So when you then use F equals MA, because that's not a constant for all mediums, right? In water, in air, in relative densities, that's always going to affect it. Does it fall 9.8 meters a second in, underwater? No. So what you have is just the equivalent buoyant uh, expression of the formula using A instead of G and describing the same thing, right? Sure, you're just saying we have an observation that things fall down at 9.8 meters per second squared. Yes, we've known that for a long time since Newton. But you're appealing to electrostatics that you can change the voltage in a Van de Graaff generator that cause things to levitate in the, or to float in a Van de Graaff generator by increasing the voltage um, difference or changing the polarity that is causing the downward bias. Where is that in the equation that's saying it's causing the downward bias in any of those equations? I don't see them in any of the equations for why things fall down. I don't see them. Where is it? Where are they in your kinematic equations for why things fall down? Do, do you want to see them? <laughs> we can we can go through that paper I was referencing real quick just to see it. Right? Here's the actual formulaic representation of the electromagnetic forces. Uh, let's see if I can share again real quick. Uh, You're good. <clears throat> The, the white one. Yeah. Do you see the electromagnetic nature of paper, the white one? Yeah, yes. the equivalency. Sure. Right. So when they're doing, again, gravitational constant, but he is just using literally electromagnetic energy density, the charge mass charge equivalents, electromagnetic nature, and Coulomb's electrostatic law. So this one right here, fundamentally the same derivation of G as a constant. This one right here, literally expounding upon it to extend 
you pretty much extrapolate the distance inverse relationship and the charge mass potential differentiation, which would be in units of U column, which comes back to, again, you get deals with particles, but essentially it's this right here expressed with this would be your formula here's the actual equivalent for the vector magnetic field potential of the permeability and permittivity and then here's the actual result where they he gets based on particles and antiparticles and the course the math for the electromagnetic vacuum which he's writing about here he gets this wonderful reduced Planck's constant in the constant measured speed of light using just uh, magnetic moments and particles and he goes through a whole bunch of other stuff that i don't understand about Inventing units <laughs> called, I just want to mention it because it's it's awesome and I've never heard of it. I think it's the uh, kenons. Yeah, kenons. If you don't get up on your kenons, they're uh, the origin of gravitation where he's a flow of kenons from surrounding space. But that's just the actual math, including uh, electromagnetic and equivalent for everything you just attributed to G, right? Isn't that what we wanted? Yeah, where's the test for this to verify that this is accurate. And um, that means that uh, Faraday cages apply now to affect this force. And I still don't see how um, the gravitational constant is in your equations for acceleration. So now you're appealing to a calculation for the gravitational constants, which is based on electrical charge versus electrical charge. Now it's gonna be based on the electrical charges of each um, item not on the mass of each item. So um, where is your uh, math for buoyancy based on electrical charges, not on mass? <clears throat> so it just says that G is depending on the local density of the vacuum and consequently not a universal constant. So when he defines it, it's with, uh, let's see, the electrostatic force and the observation of inversely proportional to mass, which is the square of the density, which is... Let's see, the four times the angle of the vacuum state, which he generalized as this wonderful Planck's local kenon, which is G equals one over four pi energy sub alpha of the product of, I don't know how that simple is, but this, this is his derivation of the actual math that would be the electromagnetic derivation of G in gravity. So he's, his position is it's all electromagnetic based and his math supports the electromagnetic basis of the fundamental constant of G, but again, we didn't start by refuting this constant quote. We accepted that it exists. We measured that it was an average and we abruptly derived the kinematic equivalent to get it based on, again, acceleration, height and time, right? So we're already working with that as a constant and a thing, an observable metric of reality. We're not discounting it. We're again, back to our different interpretive frameworks for the same phenomenon, I think. Um, I, I don't agree. If you're appealing to this as your explanation for where you get um, C, your constant, gravitational constant from, but you're calling your acceleration constant or whatever, then you're talking about the electrical charges of each mass, your, of each item, not the mass of each item. So your buoyancy should be based on the electrical charge of each item. So if you're not appealing to this uh, kinematic equivalence and I don't know why you went here at all. Well, you, you said you wanted the math for the electromagnetic <laughs> representation for the force I was describing, right? You said I was just using kinematics and non, non electromagnetism to describe an electromagnetic phenomenon. So there is the basis for the math that would describe what we're talking about. But essentially that's another example of the derivation of electromagnetic forces, right? We started with the debunk of the Cavendish doing the same thing with electrostatics that he claimed to do with mass attracting mass. And then we jumped to the Planck constant permissibility and permissivity of the electromagnetic background. And then we went to the gravitational constant. Again, that relationship between universal law of gravitation and the column law of the mass equivalence, like a mass charge equivalence. That is, they're identical. The only difference is the relationship to mass and the repellent versus repellent and attractive forces, depending on circumstances. You'd think a true fundamental force would be able to be applied. However, we have one that's particularly only attracting, even though it's responsible for all the forces we can't see a hair test measure or, you know, otherwise quantify. But what we were doing is explaining mathematically how from an energetic background with a perme per perme permeability and permissibility propagation rate that the constant rate of light speed that we see and measure is actually much more 
explainable as a rate of induction through an energetic medium. That's essentially what it comes down to is that it's better explained electromagnetically than mystically with mass attracting mass from a thing that's math magically contrived from nothing. I think I was asking where electrostatics was in your equation for buoyancy and why things fall down and stuff like that. And you never showed it. You showed an equivalency for how you can calculate um, gravitational constant, uh, which does has to do with the, I guess, the electrical charge or mass uh, energy equivalent or whatever it is. I'm not an expert. I'm not a physicist um, when it comes to that. But if you are appealing to that, then it has to do with the electrical charge of the item and not to do with the mass of the item. So again, um, you'd have to insert that into your equations for buoyancy and not the mass of the items and then not the difference in mass and density of the items. They have to be the difference of the electrical charges, the energy density of the items, not the mass density of the items for those equations to apply to buoyancy and why things fall down. So you're mixing these concepts, you're equivocating different concepts and you're mixing them together um, I, and I'm not sure why. My question specifically is, why is electrostatics in your equation for buoyancy so I can calculate what it would take to cause anything to levitate? Well, why would I have to redefine the buoyant force though? Like for why would that now need to incorporate electrostatics when that worked fine as itself using <laughs> the acceleration density of the fluid volume of the liquid right it just says that the weight the force is equal to the weight that you displace of the fluid for buoyancy so why would that need to be redefined electrostatically um because you're appealing to electrostatics which is causing the downward bias and you're also appealing to electrostatics which can actually reverse the direction of of the bias so it ought to be in the equation to explain the directionality of the buoyancy and to at least explain why things tend to fall down to give it a directionality um and it's not in the equation and i i just want to know why? So in our equation, we say the larger mass, uh, uh, that both masses attract each other. So they, they fall towards each other, right? So. But I mean, <laughs> the, the buoyant force never had a, mag a directional vector associated before. Did you, we now need to invent and incorporate one? I mean, what was the downward vector incorporating sphericity and gravity and the centripetal motion center before? Like, it was never there. It was just a description of a relationship between, you know, the amount of water displaced and weight, essentially. the We're not redefining these forces. We're just algebraically arranging them so that they don't invoke a constant g or a, phys a metaphysical a gravitational force that we're attempting to you know redefine so that's the whole purpose of this we're not redefining buoyancy or mass or density what we're proposing is a combination replacement for what we have thus far attributed to this mystical thing of g which again never been measured haven't been quantified the only thing we have basis for it is a, a dude looking in the sky and kinematically inserting mass as a as a, as a mathematical equivalent and then people pulling it out later and going hmm, i guess it wasn't the dynamic cause of everything we built upon and attributed to afterwards but when we go back to where it comes from it is essentially the basic force of everything right we don't have a, a gravitational understanding we think that it governs laws of things we in the sky that we can't see can't measure haven't been to and will never be able to corroborate but here on earth as we know and we observe in, in the lab frame so to speak electromagnetism governs everything it is the fundamental driving force it is the thing we interact with it is the strongest force and the most direct uh a causal mechanism for anything gravitation and it's one way only affecting a, a constant but it has an inverse relationship but this doesn't affect or cause anything at a local scale that's why they have trouble defining it or even you know trying to explain what it is yeah i, I i'm going to waste some time because you only well, have I'm gonna, seconds. i'm gonna let shane <laughs> uh ask you three questions he can ask you anything he wants okay. and you gotta use your time to answer it just because he had to answer a lot yeah. of your questions so uh, Shane, yeah, yeah. if you have a question for Rosie, and we can do that now, or you can wait till a little bit. Well, can I respond soon. first? And you then may. You can ask me a question. Okay. 
All right. So the reason why I asked about buoyancy is because um, uh, on the in the model that I subscribe to, um, mass attracts mass. So they're they're always attracted to each other. So directionality doesn't matter in that regard because the this this cup when I drop it, it it it, it attracts to the table, and the table's attracted up to it. Um, even though it has a from my reference frame, it looks like it's falling down, but in re in reality they're attracted to each other um but when you're appealing to a directionality with electrostatics because um in electrical theory models um it, polarity does matter the directionality matters in electrical models so especially when you're appealing to a positive up in the atmosphere and a, and a neutral or negative to ground um which is in reference to each other um that the polarity will matter when it comes to those type of equations. So I think you still need the polarity uh, to be able to calculate the polarity to be able to calculate the directionality within your model if you're going to appeal it to electrostatics. That way it can calculate um, how to invert the field to get things to levitate. And until you start including that stuff in your model so we can attest your hypotheses, you haven't actually established a valid hypothesis. But go ahead. Keep my time running. Ask your question. What do you want to ask me? Hmm. What do I want to ask you? Ask but, me about radar. <laughs> <laughs> what do you um? What do you have for an explanation? Say, if all light signals, if all GPS, if all transmissions have a bias east to west with a sort of a gradient flow. If it goes east, it has a a slower time, and if it goes with west, it has a faster time. What do you think? that would be a effect of like what is causing that observed accepted phenomenon sure so like there's lots of um uh, it's it's an area where we're not quite sure like there's like 12 different explanations for the Sagnac effect um it, some people want to claim it's like um ether winds or something like that um probably the predominant view within physics is it's due to um interference pattern that the earth is rotating. Um, and so as, so this is, I can't remember the guy that did the one test. So if you send a, we got GPS in the, in satellites. If you send a clock signal from uh, this sync to GPS clock times, like a study pulse, not like 12 o'clock, but like a study pulse. Um, if you send a GPS, uh, the clock signal from New York city to Los Angeles, and back, there's a 14 nanosecond difference between those two clock signals that we have to account for. Some people say it's C plus or minus V, depending on the directionality of the clock signal. But as we know, in reality, the Earth is a sphere and it rotates. So um, as, as the Earth is rotating, the clock in New York is moving in one direct, it's moving away. When it sends the signal to Los Angeles, it's moving away from that clock and this clock is catching up. So it takes seven nanoseconds, it's seven nanoseconds quicker. So that's what we call the Sagnac effect. And when we send it the other way, the New York clock is moving away. Did I get the directions wrong? I might got the directions wrong. Anyways, it doesn't matter. The clock is moving away in New York. So it takes seven nanoseconds longer to catch up to the clock in New York. So that's uh, what we have to account for with GPS clocks, when things are far apart or when things are moving quickly, uh, we have to account for that. And we also need four satellites to be able to get time. And we need to use general relativity and do some calculations and include Sagnac effect to be able to calculate local time um, anywhere on the planet. Because satellites are moving too, so we have to account for those moving. That, wow. Next question. That's not a terrible uh, recitation, uh, honestly. I mean, I disagree with all of it, but as far as people <laughs> who presented it coherently, that, that's not bad. Like, so the range measurement equation in GPS already accounts for SAGNAG. It's a time interval system. They do apply additional corrections and not <laughs> anything to do with the north-south variance. There's nothing north-south that would be the case if what you're saying was the effect. It is only east to west. So essentially, there's no north-south variance. But... The USAGNAC is not a rotational effect. It's actually been linearized a couple times and generalized. So it's observably, provably, mathematically, and uh, 
physically just describing a linear motion. So there's no reason why that should have anything to do with the East West in, in interference, but not, not a bad, uh, like I said, not a bad, not a bad on the spot recitation to something that people usually specialize in, right. As a topic for another question, um, do the main difference between us, right, actually has nothing to do with the shape of the earth. It's our general understanding of the, uh, let's see, the, the fact that a small group of, let's say, individuals have seized control of infrastructure, education, you know, manufacturing, ah, education, here come the and news. That they have used that for nefarious purposes, not to our benefit. You or most people in the globe don't accept that. I think it's a conspiracy or various great issues therein. Essentially, the faith in the government and the system and the mainstream is what separates us more than anything to do with shape. But what do you think is what, what's one conspiracy that you actually believe in, dude? Like J, JFK, who shot JFK? Um, I don't accept any conspiracy theories as true. Uh, I need to see them proven in court of law as true to accept them as true. Um, I call myself the conspiracy theory slayer. So, and, and I am a uh, philosophical naturalist. So, um, anyways, so I I am skeptical in that regard of any type of claims. I'm I'm not as much of a cynic um, as I could be, maybe, um, which I think is more where conspiracies come from, is cynicism. But um, go go ahead with your next question. It was the CIA, by the way, in case you were wondering. Ah! <laughs> and then yeah. From there, you go to 9-11 and the conspiracy, you know, the faith in government all the way through, oh you know, war, money, currency, education, financial systems, uh, block, you know, who's Vanguard and block? I'm just kidding. Yeah. But like <laughs> the other thing that I'd want to ask you, I think would be, what, what do you think of uh, the general Glober method of uh, instead of answering questions and thinking about stuff, attacking, obfuscating, emotionally charging, invoking, uh, distracting, you know, all the stuff mm -hmm. that we see from like, say, FTFE and the likes of the uh, more egregious people. I see you stop it on your show, but what do you think about it? Um, I think um, FTFE, um, Craig, has changed his um, approach to debates, the last few debates. And even with me, if somebody attacks me personally, I seem to respond like, don't call me a liar, I get annoyed. Um, like when I debated Craig, I, I responded, not Craig, but when I debated Caleb, I knew how Caleb debated by watching in the past. So I had an approach for Caleb. But look how I'm debating you. Like this is normally how I debated. When I debated Nathan Thompson, I swore he was going to ask me on a debate. Now, I might kid about being gay. I'm really not gay. I, I'm really not into trans women. I know I, I make those jokes and stuff like that. But unless you're hot, then maybe, you know, hey, you're a hot trans woman. You, you got my email. It's on my YouTube channel. <laughs> but I'm not sure where I was going with that. But ask me another <laughs> question. Like, oh, yeah. no, I just want to say... I take people basically at their word. If they say that they believe the, the shape of the earth, I take them at their word. Um, now I do skeptic, skept, I think you're, uh, that we have motivated reasoning a lot of times. Motivated reasoning. Yeah, you're motivated towards a specific conclusion. Now Trans, that's, that's true for me crazy too, now. because I'm motivated towards a natural conclusion, a natural explanation for everything. So. Um, because I am a philosophical naturalist, so I, I reject all supernatural claims as being false, that there is a natural explanation for all claims. Mm -hmm. Now, people, now that was asked in my last debate, why, what would change my worldview? So my worldview is that my worldview is not the earth is a globe. My worldview is that everything has a natural explanation. Well, just so you know, uh, you're a vine, you're the center of everything, everything is geocentric. Yeah, just, just in case you were wondering, everything revolves around you, but... <laughs> uh, no, it doesn't. Cool. What do you, what, what do you think of like, um, so when we argue, right? Do you think that flat earthers generally have an understanding of the globular model, the physics, the measurements, the distances, no, versus do general globus have globers have a any idea of what say just the flat earther they're talking to? is saying because like when we ask people to steal man right i'll be honest dude the you on the last june someone asked you to steal man and on the spot you gave a, a rendition that was like a, he was listening right and that was like oh 
I'll, I'll debate that, dude. He listens. At least most people don't listen, right? They wait to, to say the next thing. They have no understanding of what was just said to them. They're just going to go for the next thing. So I appreciate that you don't do that. The amount but of Globers compared to Flutter is not fair. You can fair steal man most as, every as a, the argument, and the inverse mm -hmm. is absolutely a source yeah. of data. Not correct. That would be, uh, that would be um, biased. Do some that. people eat purple crayons. Um, so <laughs> with that being said, um, I'm not going to say that would be like a fallacy to say everybody's the same within a group. Um, I argue with atheists all the time. I'm an atheist because I don't like it when they um, call people sky daddies or when they tell me I can't believe a God doesn't exist. They tell me you can't believe a God doesn't exist. But why? I'm an atheist. You have to lack a belief. I'm like, I'm a philosophical atheist, so I do philosophical arguments in the debate. Anyways, that's a side tangent. So I I argue with people on all types. I just I just want to put this out there, and then and then people will deny IQ is a thing, but we do have IQs. I just wanted to point this out. There is an average intelligence. There's an average intelligence, and then there's Einstein, and and by golly, not everybody's an Einstein. And not everybody's average intelligence. There's people below average intelligence and people above average intelligence. And um, that's it. I Yeah. And the Earth is a globe. Space is real. I love NASA. I, I, I want to go to Mars. Please. Elon Musk, take me to Mars. I know I'm too old. <laughs> I'm broken. But I'll, I'll have your child. Just do a womb transplant. Do you believe in womb transplants? Because some flat earthers do. right now. I can tell from the phrasing that absolutely not. No. <laughs> All right, you got 37 seconds till your outro, so go ahead. Okay, so I, I just, I, I was going to use it to waste time, eight minutes, but this was a fruitful conversation. I really did enjoy it. People got to know a little bit about me. Just come check out my channel. I have Flat Earthers on. I had Flat Soid on talking about biblical cosmology. I did not attack him. I gave him a good hour or so to explain what he believed. I asked some probing questions, and that was it. I'm not there to attack you, but I am there to deconstruct your beliefs and change your view. All right. Excellent. All right. We've got uh, one minute on the clock for each one. Uh, just sum up your argument as best you can in one minute. I know it's not long, but uh, just close this out, and then we'll get to the super chat questions, get them in now, and then uh, Witsit's coming up next, so we'll, we'll move over to there. Go ahead. Ozzy. Yeah, with, with everything being said here, I think electrostatics doesn't have any um, explanation for why things fall down. I don't think it explains why there is a downward bias, even if I'm going to steal man his claim. Other people have have said it is what causes things to fall down, so I wasn't straw manning a particular claim. I, I actually quoted the person that said that specifically. Um, I think I showed that because they don't show electrostatics within their model at all, they can't explain what would cause things to levitate. Electrostatics is about what causes things to attract to each other and repel each other based on electrical charges. It has nothing to do with why there's a downward bias. And the Feynman lecture was about lightning and about whether it had nothing to do with gravity at all. And thank you very much, Jaron, for hosting us. It was a lovely discussion, Shane. Thank you. All right, Shane, go ahead. Nice. You got a minute. Whenever you start, we'll start the clock. Nice. Yeah, so thanks, everyone. Thanks, Ozzy, for being cool and cordial and having a productive engagement. Uh, this is probably what I thought it would be. I'm glad it was. So summarizing, right? Incoherent electrostatic acceleration is definitely the force responsible for determining the downward vector. The electric forces, rather than gravitational forces, dominate our world and immediate surroundings and everyone to every model, which is fact. The electric force versus gravitational force, of course, is 30, 37 times 10 to, 30, 10 to 37 times weaker. So then would be a causal mechanism of nothing. The basis for the mass attracting mass has been refuted, de demolished, kinematically derived, and coming up with a uh, simple observation based on optics. So we have a gradient on Earth that is observed, measurable, we can use corona matters to pull electricity right out of the atmosphere based on this gradient's existence. And then we use the uh, other basis of the way the atoms work with density and the way gases work and the way density is sorted out with the gradient is all based on electrostatic and electromagnetic forces. I think we pretty much solved that out. Also, having an after show, I'm sure Ozean is, but on EtherCause, we're going to do space audits and EtherCause after show. Everyone's welcome. So thanks, everyone. 
All right. Thank you. It matters now. <laughs> Sorry. After show. Dang it. it. Matters now after show. And also Austin's going to be going live with a Trump show. So uh, oh. in about 20 minutes or so. All right. We're <laughs> I just saw the next Ew. super chat. Do we have three buzzers still. We never use a buzzer. I guess you can buzz. Yeah, I knew we wouldn't, you... honestly. I was like, I am not for sure. I've seen that. All right. Oh, well, look. Do they work? At least I guess they work. He changed the X's. Buzz for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So we're going to look at the first. We're going to look at Rockfin real quick. See what we got there. Thank you guys so much. We got somebody who didn't ask a question. Then Felix Ofer donated 20 bucks a few times saying, please host a debate conversation about the reptilians. All right. Just so people know, I don't really actively go out and seek people to debate. They so far have started to approach us and say, hey, I got a debate between me and so and so. So. Tell whoever you like that talks about reptilians to debate here on the show, and that's the way we'll do it. But uh, I'll, I don't... I'll debate against it. Okay, I'll definitely. debate against reptilians. How many people will debate pro? David Ike, and that's about it. Who else? Maybe somebody else. All right, we'll we'll, we'll try and find oh, this. Is pro? Thank you very, very much, Felix. Themselves. I do appreciate that. Let's go to YouTube. See what we got there. I did see quite a few of them. Let's go over here quick. Okay. Oh, he's against. It. Uh, let's start oh, at the okay. top. We've got. Thank you very much, Justin Johnson, who gifted five memberships. We've got a question for Shane from Kango44. He says, why is it harder to carry a weight up a slope or stairs than along a flat surface? <laughs> why is it harder to go against the force of the measured agreed upon average of the downward acceleration? I don't know. It seems like it'd be easier to go with a river than against it, right? Okay. So a good answer. We've got <clears throat> Taking Back Eden says, thank you, Ozian, Shane, and Jaren. Thank you, Taking Back Eden. We've got <laughs> Eugene Austin who said, Ozian, just admit it, bro. You and Tune and all the others are paid opposition. We just want to know who writes the checks. That's all I promise. YouTube's writing me a check for $230 for this month. So <laughs> thank you, YouTube. And they actually take my money. So, you know. <laughs> I think I spend more in Super Chats. Yeah. Uh, Kango44 is back. He says, for Shane, given a ball that weighs five kilograms, two meters from the ground, Impulsed with 700 newtons or 700 ends applied horizontally. I can tell you where it would land. Please tell me where it would land using your electrostatic stuff. Boom. What an interesting gotcha. Next. Boom. <laughs> um, uh, gravity relies on mass and an gotcha. object. in. Oh, so this is Hercules. Thank you very much. Or Heracles. Thank you very much. Five bucks. Ozean, if gravity relies on mass and an object in free fall has no mass, how does the earth create gravity? When it is in free fall around the sun, how does the Earth create gravity? If it's in the Earth is in the Earth create gravity? Just the gravity is a property of mass. So um, the Earth has mass. So the Earth has gravity. But he and said, it's in orbit around the sun. So it's in you could call it in free fall. So for appealing to Newtonian um, physics, then it's um, Brief is leaving away, and actually, if we just their relativity, it's actually following a straight line in non Euclidean space in a manifold. There, okay, you believe that? Okay, let's go with the next. All oh, right, and he said, Oh, yeah, yeah you got that part. Uh, Witsa gets it to Oz. Thank you very much. Witsa, 10 bucks says, Ozian, we can directly manipulate electrostatics as the casual agent to alter the weight, rate, and fall and vector of an object experimentally. Can you do the same with your reified belief of gravity? Yes, we can do it with the Cavendish experiment by changing the size of the mass and by changing the distance between the two masses. Boom. But not change the causal agent, he's saying? Um, we can change the size of the mass. Okay. So the, the, mass, the gotcha. mass changes the amount of force in the equation. So to calculate what the gravitational constant is. So yes, we can term determine what the amount of force is being acted upon between the two masses using the Cavendish experiment by changing the size of the mass, which is fixed, and then separating the, um, the distance between the two masses. Okay. Uh, Heracles, thank you very much for joining the club. Same thing with D-Town Books, ABQ. Uh, Kango, back again, says, for Shane, so your car was built using Newtonian mechanics. Please explain how you might compute the required volume of an airbag to safely absorb the collision of an accelerated mass like your head. 
That's what I was right? saying. There's so much calculation you have to do with the cards. They physics, don't even take that into account. Laws, and then Newton is uh, kind of an old doddering fool, but whatever. <laughs> okay. That's Kango why it works, is, and you don't Kango know why it works. Killing, Kango, like, assassinated him twice. An actual explanation, yet Shane does. Uh, I don't have an explanation. I gave an explanation. Gravity is mass attracts mass. Um, he he's saying gravity is electrostatics. Okay, cool. Next, okay. Eugene Austin says Ozean light is not sentient. It doesn't act like a particle when you need it to, and it doesn't know you're watching it. Talk about crazy. I agree. All right. Well, okay. Good. We're still getting somewhere. Making friends here. Which it gets it back again. Theory of relativity reifies mathematical coordinate systems as con and concepts. Ozean, can you attribute physical properties to conceptual abstractions? Um, it depends. So if you have a concept, so basically theorems within science are axioms. So you propose certain, you have an observation, you propose certain axioms to explain the observations, then you go do tests. So if the tests confirm the axioms, axioms being these concepts, then it supports the axioms as being concrete things that um, are more likely to be true. So yes, you can you can support axioms as being concrete things based upon based upon testing. So yeah. Do you have a comment there, Shane? Is that you getting ready to comment? Nope. Okay. Well, we were looking back to the uh, Kepler. We said that how does you have mass as equivalent count? And actually, you can reduce it from mass, and then you're left with a description of a periodicity, which is just Kepler again. So when you're saying well, how does mass get derived, it isn't. It's a mathematical trick. You can only get the same thing factorially scaled from covariantly scaling optics. That's all. Okay, LJ. <laughs> Thank you very much. Two bucks says, Ozian, what if NASA officially admits the Earth is flat? I would uh, believe NASA was lying. I would be a cynic. Okay. Why? <clears throat> you don't believe Why? in any because conspiracies, though. I have my own reasons for rejecting the Earth is flat. Do you treat every announcement with NASA with the same discernment? Um, only ones that fit within my model of reality or don't. Hmm. So NASA is not within my model of reality. I wrote a book about my model of reality. It's called Beyond Faith on, by Ozian on Amazon. <laughs> Get your copy today. Did you? Did you really? Did yeah, you have a ghostwriter or did you write it? <laughs> I wrote it. I had on iTunes. Really? It's like a syllogism though, so it's boring. They, and you yeah. really you really think no conspiracies exist? I don't believe conspiracy theories are true. There are conspiracies that have been proven to be true. But like weren't they all war, conspiracy theories war. before that? <laughs> Usually not. So a lot of really? <laughs> most, cons yeah. Good. So I've done it. I went to and looked at the number of conspiracy theories um, that are out there and the, a number of them that were confirmed to be true. And it's like 2%. So like I just off the bat, I'm just almost justified in rejecting all new conspiracy theories as being like false. Snopes fact check said it wasn't true. So I'm good. Would that yeah, be basically it was Snopes fact check. Did you watch my debate? On conspiracy theories, wouldn't that no, be like me that. saying that there was like a you know I don't know hidden hidden secrets or things that, secrets between people? And I would say I went out and checked, and there's no secrets between people, so that, that therefore I conclude <laughs> that there is no secrets between people. No, there's there's secrets between people, but yeah, and like two so percent of them are known. So then there's only there's well, only two percent conspiracy is not typically what we mean uh, by secret. So. We can have secrets, but conspiracy, when we talk about conspiracies, usually conspiracy to do serious Correct. or criminal, right? So a conspiracy theory means typically that there are facts that are unknown that cause a bridge between X and Z. So okay. Y is missing. So because Y is missing, I'm not justified in believing Z is true. Until I have the evidence for Y, I, I can't be justified in believing Z. And usually I hold to the principle that until it's solved in some type of court or hearing or something like that, where I am privy to all the facts and where some type of rules of evidence are, are adhered to for admittance of the facts, then um, I'm not really privy to the proper evidence. So I went to law school, so I'm an idiot. 
in that regard too. Um, <laughs> so like I, I sort of adhere to sort of that concept where not all evidence, not all claims that things are evidence are actually evidence towards the claim either. Okay. So we've got, uh, Felix Ofer over here as well. Guys, you just uh, please host a debate conversation about reptilians who eat up my people as they eat bread. Psalms 14, four. All right, Felix, you must know somebody who believes that. So get them to get in contact with me. People can go to t.me slash debatism. If you want on telegram and there's a group there, throw your name in a hat, come and debate. We've got KD who says definitely a flat earther now. Thanks. Ozian. Dollar nine. Thank you very much. We've got Joan Margaret with five bucks. That. Thank you very much, Joan. We've got Kevin. He's been a member for a month. He said, gravity attracts math. You said it right accidentally, Ozian. Uh, we've got <laughs> Demon Stride says, Shane Splained. Nice job. Well done, guys. Join the after show at discord.gg slash Demon Stride. There's a lot of after shows going on. People will not have a lack of things to do. Eugene Thank Austin you says, for anyone job. unfamiliar with relativity, all it is in relation to cosmology is we can't know anything, so we know everything. Now go read it. <laughs> <laughs> that's good stuff all right um we've got uh james brown james brown wow uh oz shame i don't really know what that is star earth death music eyeballs anybody wow. know how to read how to read star, emoji earth, death, music. Oh, they hit me in my soul i think that <laughs> bunch of emojis i don't know i'm supposed to read that or something all right we got uh shane thanks this was great Shane, you're not supposed to debate. You're not supposed to donate on your own stream. Come on. Thank you very much for that. Appreciate that. Eugene Austin, five bucks, says hot trans women definitely works for NASA. NASA is inclusive. They do uh, They do have quite a few. <laughs> of those. They let those over there. So that's good. Equity, inclusion, and diversity or whatever the channel of the Antichrist yeah, is. Absolutely. Uh, Shane, thank you very much for joining the Journalism Club. We've got Adam, 10 bucks, says Shane, I've been hearing a lot of Globers saying the Soros cycle can only be pre postdicted on a globe. Would you please explain how they are wrong? Yeah, real quick, uh, they would be right in the aspect that the only way you can plot it is on a coordinate system derived from geodesic surveying and astrodetic coordinates in the sky. So we can't plot it without having a map. That's the only way we can get a map. That being said, you can plot it based on the celestial sphere and you draw the plane of ineptitude through the center of the celestial sphere, through the occultic body, and through those planes, you can juxtapose the XY Cartesian coordinates, which are just the uh, combination of what Apollo and the Excelian elements that you could compute whichever which way I used Excel to do that. Or you can just go to the EclipseWise database, hit a button, and they'll give you all that to do the same thing. So can we map it on any coordinate system, any map? Absolutely. Are they all derived from the celestial coordinate system? Unfortunately, yeah. Okay. Kango44, 10 bucks says, Shane, my question wasn't a gotcha. I asked you to solve simple dynamics question with your model. So after speaking on it for two hours, you can't answer a simple question? Oh, yeah, I selectively choose who to engage with, and I don't care about your question, sir. So, ah, okay, can go? I asked, uh, what's it says five bucks. Uh, I asked you if you can manipulate gravity, not mass, then beg the question. Mass attracting mass is not an explanation. Even Newton said he did not have one, right? Uh, we can't manipulate the gravitational constant, we can uh, manipulate the force, which is what we are trying to calculate is gravitational constant. So, we can manipulate the gravitational force. FG by changing the mass using the Cavendish experiment or changing the distance. So yes, we can manipulate the gravitational force with the Cavendish experiment, just like you can you uh, manipulate the electrostatic voltage and change the amount of attraction or repelling. You can change the polarity to, to do the same thing. So there you go. There. All right, that's it. Thank you guys very much. It was fun. Let's uh, just go ahead and say your goodbyes and where they can find you and, and sign up for your shows or whatever. Uh, Ozzy, go ahead. You start us off. Um, come check us out on Matters Now. Um, I We have two main hosts, my channel, but Max hosts the after shows and pre-shows, so you go check us out there right now, and I'll be there in a few minutes. And um, I do reschooling Flat Earther shows, sort of um, – mimicking like the discord shows over there on the ether cosmology channel <laughs> okay and we've got uh shane now go ahead and give us your where people can find you where you'll be for the cool. after show yeah, it's good to know that uh we're so impactful that we have copycats already Ozan, that's cool <laughs> but, you're welcome 
Don't go out, call you, go be got our after show. Cosmology.com. And we can always find me, adl.place is the easiest way. It has all the links, all the sources, all the databases, all the publishment. Literally everything I said today is on a database page there called Debate Opener. Everything I said in order, all the derivations, backup, electrostatic equivalents, other papers, corroborative PDFs, essential sources, other topics that we are exploring, all available publicly nobody looks i don't know why it's the biggest thing i've never understood and uh thanks everyone thanks to Odin for being chill and cordial and thanks jaren for hooking it up and having a great space and by the way you are the de facto best moderator i've ever seen jaren <laughs> well you guys make it easy when you guys do uh, make it easy hey i'll take it i've been reading i've been reading all your papers on stream so have you have you been yeah. summarizing it with uh, ai or reading them I've been reading them and going over the, the one guy, is the analyst. He's horrible. Stone? Anyways, not Stone. I don't. I haven't seen anything from Stone. Anyways, off topic. Good stuff. All right. Thanks, dude. <laughs> Thanks, guys. And if you want to join the coolest club ever, check out uh, WAP, W-H-O-P dot com dot com slash Jaronism. Uh, no, no. What? What? All right. So... That was uh, fun. Thank you, everyone, for hanging out. Uh, I have no idea what WAP is, and now they're they're propping up a Witsit uh, Trump thing, so I have no idea. Welcome back! How are you, Oz? That was fun. We had a lovely time here on the... On the the viewing party, watch party. Sorry, I'm uh, I'm lagging. Uh, but it was fun, really, uh, really fun. I'm here. Sorry, I thought you guys would be watching it here. Yes, we like, were. Just, oh no, I mean like sharing it. That's yes, okay, we, whatever. We were, we were. We shared oh, you just it. stopped sharing it. Yeah, I stopped oh, when okay. they started doing their own uh, the, their own publicity. I stopped. Oh, okay. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, but we had a lot of fun. We have a couple of questions and uh, comments from from I'm everyone. Sure. Miles Wilton sent a ten dollar super chat. Thank you so much for that. And uh, I think this question was meant for Shane, but he sent it here. What potential would cause a nine point eight meters per uh, square upward acceleration? I think I asked him several times, like, <laughs> where is it in your formulas? I literally, like, had eight minutes to just grind it in at the end, but I was nice. Like, yeah. He spent uh, a lot of time talking. Jaron came to a rescue and gave him those free questions at the end. That's okay. Yeah, I know, I know. You're, you're too nice. I would have said no. <laughs> But thank you, Miles Wilson, for the $10. That's very generous of you. Yes, thank you so much. Um, let uh, Brenda and Billy, give us, uh, how did you like the watch party? Let's start with Billy, and then we'll go on to Brenda. How did you like the watch party? Did you enjoy it? Yeah, it was good. Uh, I, it was, like uh, like Ozian said, uh, mainly Shane was wasting too much time, and then... I think he wasn't really getting to the point. He was just like repeating the same electrostatic, but then we can measure electrostatics. And if a, if if there was a case in the cars, wouldn't work properly if we weren't, if we weren't able to account for electrostatics. It would it would fuck up your car. Yeah, there's a lot to, to that. Uh, Brenda, give us your thoughts on the watch party and the debate, if you want. Mm, your mic might not be working. Maybe try refreshing the window or something and we'll get back to you. So, Oz, how, how did you feel? Did you enjoy it? We have a couple of messages. For example, NetTube user says, one of the reasons I like Shane is because even when he's laughing about Ozian's inquiries, he never resorts to insults or displays anger. And I kind of agree. He, yeah, he's good he in that fine. sense. I um uh, I think I did exactly what I planned on doing there. I think I challenged his whole concept with electromechanics, even if he um was appealing to it as a um, preferred direction or as a the 
the explanation for the acceleration and in neither example does it explain anything like it mm -hmm. didn't explain anything and uh Joss incarnate says Oz's opening was amazing we agree it was on point and uh brenda now that you're back give us a, a mic check huh no mic. are we yeah no we're not hearing you them hopefully right. she can get that resolved and uh, match uh, it was a nice clean debate those young one easily and there's no stupid drama about it yep the it was it was very interesting and it, it remained cordial no no major like interruptions and both people both speaking at a time so uh, with us we know that he's this way but uh, it, it was really entertaining to see shane also keep up that standard which is what we like here and we have tyler with us tyler how are you tyler unfortunately his headset died and he couldn't join us for the watch party but he was there in the audience tell us how did you like the watch party and uh, your first impressions on the debate uh i thought the watch party was terrific uh i had a lot of fun with all of you watching and, and cheering along and jeering along and uh calling out some of the stuff and uh can, can, can you hear me okay are these headphones all right yes perfect okay awesome so yeah i, I thought it was terrific there's there's a part of me that was kind of hoping you'd bounce us over to wits it so we can watch a whinge about trump but i guess the, we got to do this so it, it's, it's all good either way i, I thought it was great ah. you're all great company the idea of watching wits it talk about politics makes my brain sad so no uh sydney raptor sends us two messages watch party was awesome nasty and super intelligible In <laughs> intelligential sorry i messed that up i almost got it because he said wait for max to pronounce my new words i almost got it well my my impressions about the debate though it, it, it's a fascinating concept i mean it really makes me appreciate mdd and how they're very non-biased because it, it, it's excruciatingly obvious listening to Jaron, especially at the end there where it became like a 2v1, talking about conspiracy theories. Like Jaron is just like full blown sitting right next to, to Shane on the same bench. And it was, it was fascinating. So it, 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 was a, it was a decent debate. It wasn't like Caleb, you know, kind of the tone and everything. Like it was a bit more cordial and stuff like that. So I appreciated that. Uh, I found Shane's like three minute nuh uhs were pretty funny. Like he, he used a lot of words to say nuh uh. And uh, <laughs> that was kind of entertaining. Wasn't he even addressing like the Cavendish experiment? He kept going to, I, that's why I meant one of the times I forgot what I was going to address was. Uh, he kept like talking about the science history for the Cavendish experiment. And I understand the Cavendish experiment was about measuring the mass of the earth, but it still measures the gravitational constant mass attracting mass. Also, like, anyways. Mm -hmm. yeah. There was like, a lot what... of good that came out of that debate, though. Like, even <laughs> maybe we'll get into it later, but yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> one one thing, uh, uh, for the most part, when Shane was sharing his screen, he was doing it on the virtual camera, and we were here. We were we were wondering why isn't he sharing it on like a full screen? Because it was hard to read. What, what did you think about that? Sometimes I struggled reading it when he had bad reception, but most of the time I could read it on um, what he was sharing. But none of what he shared was answering my questions. He was just replacing G with A. Like, right. I was asking about electrostatics. Like, so you're just showing a kinematic equation, you're not explaining what electrostatics is doing. Like, I should have pushed harder against it. that, but I was going to push harder against that with my final seven minutes. That I spanked in the <laughs> end, but it I lost it. I had a bunch of notes I was going to press at the end, but anyway, uh, it, it is what it is. 
Net to user says, congratulations to Ocean for his composed demeanor, patient attitude, open mindedness, open mindedness, and the high quality of his debates. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, looks like we got Brenda back. Well, to respond to it, Ozian was just saying, if I may. Um, ah, Shane we're not hearing approach. you, Brenda, just in case. That is sad. I really wanted to get your opinion. Maybe uh, connect from your phone. We we can try that, see if that works. Because it doesn't seem to be working. Sorry, no. Tyler. Go ahead. No, I, I didn't know Brenda got in. I'm sorry. I... I, I was just thinking because Shane's approach um, regarding like how he was making his argument and just kind of pushing through his presentation, I feel like he knew he had a home field advantage. So he wasn't as much debating Oz as much as he was grandstanding to the home team, like the home team crowd kind of a thing. And I feel that that was his approach to this. Like not don't don't debate the opponent kind of just, you know, jump up on a milk crate and laugh whenever the other guy makes a valid point. Uh huh. Oh, fair enough. And uh, Mash says, Othian really nailed it tonight. I'm not a super big fan of Oz's super chill style, but tonight it really served him well. Kudos to Othian and well, well earned win. Thank you so much for your comment. And Sydney says, Good observation to what you said just now. Tyler, uh, did it did it go as you thought it would go, Oz? I did exactly what I wanted to do. Um, I was really hoping he would address my points better, um, Doctor J's here. Uh, Hello. But I don't think he engaged with my my points as well as I wanted him to. But that's okay. Yeah, it happens. Hello, Dr. J. Long time no see. Good to have you with us. How are hey, you? Hey, good, good. I've had more work I've had to do, and my nephews have roped me into some Dota, so I've been playing more of that lately. <laughs> uh, did you get a chance to watch the debate on Jaren's channel or here in the in the watch party? I was on the watch party. I probably caught the second half, maybe, or so. I don't think I caught, caught all of it, but yeah, I enjoyed right. it. All right, uh, we, we might do some more watch parties because it, it was fun, the banter with the audience. And I didn't want to pause this debate because I wanted to like let it run. But uh, we managed to get some tidbits in and it was uh, fun times overall. I, I really enjoyed it. And uh, if you can see here, like here, Dr. J, we're counting down the days to the rapture. Shout out, Christ brings the sword. Did he predict the rapture was going to happen? Yes, 40 days after the eclipse. Oh, good. Well, hey, I got to quit working so hard. I, I just need to coast <laughs> out these next 39 days. I'll let my bosses know I'm done. Uh, Sydney Raptor says that your glowy headphones are killing it. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What did you think about the debate overall? Um, did you think electrostatics explains the downward acceleration? Or I, I, I really feel like once you start getting into the more complicated math stuff, it's a little bit hard for me to follow, but it, it seems like he can't explain it. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you ask him a question and he just doesn't really know the answer. And when you get into the harder math stuff, you end up talking way more. And it's like, well, I mean... At least wits it talks all the time when you get into the more complicated stuff. I mean, uh, I'm not sure whether he's saying what he's saying is correct or not, but at least he yaks, you know, a lot. Um, so to me, it, it it seems like he doesn't really know, you know, how it works quite. So that that was the impression I got. But I, I'm not the greatest, you know, um, most knowledgeable or whatever you want to say on flat Earth stuff or globe Earth for that matter. <laughs> NetTube user says, in my view, super chill style debate is mature, devoid of insults or condescension. I engage in debate not for entertainment, but to listen, reflect, and learn. And Diversion Science says, Ocean playing calm and cool, but we all know, we all saw him murder Shane. Uh, we, we had a, a, an awesome a time cool, huh? here. What's a cool, um, yeah. <laughs> that was he, fun. I don't think he even knew what I was asking him. But that's okay. Like, 
because because he denies atoms exist, he has to deny electrons exist. So it was sort of a gotcha question. Because yeah, and then like he appeals to like um, Coulomb's law, which is about uh, electric um, density. Uh, like for explaining stuff, but then all the then my argument for electrostatics for the G constant applies. Then it's like if my argument applies, that means I refuted it with my my formulas and stuff. It's like or, or it's a downward bias if it's if it's just a downward bias and not a force. Then you why are you appealing to Coulomb's law? It's like. Dude, you're you're like you're mixing concepts. They're contradicting yourself. I was nice to him. I was I was really nice. Yeah. Like I was nice to him. But he was contradicting himself. Some some other people would have not let that go throughout the whole debate. When when you find that place where you can stick your knife in, uh, some other people would have let that go. But I think that what you did was correct. You showed that. You show the contradiction, show that he didn't know the, the concept of, or he can't accept the concept of what a Coulomb is and then moved on because it, it, make, it, it doesn't really make sense to just pile on to the same thing for an hour. Cool. Coulomb's, Coulomb's law? It's Coulomb. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. but that, it was a running joke during the watch oh. party that he pronounced it like Coulomb. Oh, whatever. Yeah, just uh, we're just bantering. Yeah, but we we did a lot of that. It was it was a lot of civil banter though. We we tried. The, no, I didn't see many insult thrown, and I don't know if I see him in the chat anymore. Because but there was a guy named TV who was mad at you both of you arguing for the downward bias, and he would just say, oh, "There's no downward bias. There's no downward bias." And I told him, "Stick around for the after show," but he left. Well, yeah, I I explained that like there's no downward bias in my view, so I don't need a polarity. But he's arguing for a downward bias, so there should be a polarity in your formulas because you're appealing to electricity for a downward bias. Because in in reality, we don't have a preferential direction. Like there is no downward bias, and I explained that finally. But you know what? You know when that clicked. That there should be a polarity, first time that clicked, was right there in that debate. Uh -huh. It was right then. It never clicked before. But if they're appealing to it being a downward bias, then there should be a polarity in the in those formulas. Right. And, and you should be able to ma manipulate the polarity to change the, the direction. And it's not in the formula, and there's no way to calculate it. They don't have the explanation for it. So if they're appealing to electricity, DC electricity, then there should be a polarity in the formula, and there's not. There's no polarities. Anyways. <laughs> Real signal says, and Gothian surface, bro. Yeah, whatever. Uh, you didn't press on that one. You could have pressed on, okay, show, what are the Gaussian surfaces? We have the I ground, probably sure. didn't hear it. What, what is the, the above surface? Because it, it would have to be the dome. But then they say it's glass. So how do is it some magic conductive glass or, or well, what? Yeah, he never. Oh, Brenda's back. He he never explained what was causing the electrostatic field either, or where the forces come from, where the power comes from. I tried to press him on that, but we had this back and forth. I was banking time. Anyways, and I wasn't allowed to ask him questions. Like I can explain where the power comes from. It comes from the sun. Mm -hmm. from thermodynamic from from the energy from the sun but he doesn't have any explanation for where the power comes from to explain all these phenomenon that's why i asked him do you accept like the first and second law this is general concepts and if you do where's the power come from to explain why things fall and he didn't answer he, he obfuscated like i had an answer but it's Silly. I was, I was uh, oh my goodness. Was that me or is that someone else? No, that was Brenda. Brenda, something's wrong. What now we hear a jackhammer in the background. Yeah, there's a conspiracy. Someone doesn't want oh. Brenda to speak in the after show. Who's doing that? Uh I really like 
that you made one of your jokes at the end and uh, I was watching uh, a little bit of Jaren's chat and they fucking lost it. All when about you... trans? They were pissed. They were pissed. They, yeah. they... Well, they... well, they were making puke faces and stuff like that. Was, yeah. yeah. They, were, they, were they lost their they shit. They figured out. I just said, as long as she's hot. Yeah, yeah, but th you know that that makes them mad. The only worst thing that you could have done is do the horns. And oh. when when Shane put on his demons in the background, <laughs> you should have gone with the horns, and you would have made everyone lose their mind. I thought you were gonna say the only thing worse is if you would have said, as long as she's got nice feet or something like that. Because <laughs> I think that would have got the. Uh, Got the puke faces and in, in, in uh, multiples right there. Brenda charging up her Brandergraph generator. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I, I was really interested to to get her her opinion on the watch party because she was here with us and she she made some very nice comments and we had a lot of fun. I I really enjoyed it. So everyone. <laughs> Like the, the average 50 of you that were here during the watch party, thank you so much for hanging out with me. It's a, it's way more fun to watch a debate with a lot of people and read the comments. And it's it's so much fun to do it like that. Um, NetTube user, I have a question for Dr. J. Are you perched on a dentist chair by any chance? It looks so comfy, I'm jealous. Well, as someone who's been gone to the dentist quite a bit lately, I think my chair is more comfortable than a dentist chair. So I guess you can you can be jealous. I, I love this chair. It's worked out really well. Uh, yeah. Uh, Dr. J's chair is enigmatic at this point. Uh, we love it. Uh, so that, what up? Go ahead. I was going to answer what's question. Um, Matt, uh, Modern Day Debate has done that debate on Super Straight. If you're a transphobe or not, I don't think you are. Uh, if you're not into trans people, I think that's that's just fine. I'm really not. I just I just say that because I think it's funny. Uh, I I actually I don't know. Like I'm not into procreating anymore. Like, but uh, just, so does that make you asexual or or voluntarily? No, I'm, not, I'm not into Damn like sexual. certain appliances at certain humans have i'm into other types of appliances like it when i buy appliances for my kitchen um uh, i i like certain types of appliances <laughs> yeah but there's there's okay. nothing wrong with that no but i i know i i get what you do because it just makes them lose their mind because because I read one of the comments when you said, well, I'm not gay. And someone was in the comments there saying, oh, well, yeah, you are gay. It's like, dude, how do you know? How can you know? How, like, this is insane. It's so funny. It I, do it on, I do it on purpose. Like, I know, is I it, Because they, they think it it's to shock them anyways. Yes. Yeah. There's nothing uh, but, wrong with being gay, so it doesn't matter. If, if someone thinks you're gay, it doesn't matter. And there's nothing wrong with being straight or with liking trans people or with being trans. Yeah. It's like... The whole identitarian politics thing has gotten out of control. I mean, I, I haven't been on a date in about 10 years. I've been called incel. I've been called asexual. And each time I'm just like, no, I'm a picky eater. I, I haven't met the right one yet. So I, I don't know. That's fine. Yeah. Each one's lifestyles is uh, it's uh, to each their own, but we embrace everyone and we love everyone. The only thing, the only ones that we don't love are the ones that insult other people and that are general a holes. But other than that, we we enjoy everyone. Team Rob says, uh, "Picky here uh, too, Tyler. Picky eater, very very picky." All right, <laughs> let's see if we can get. Is this working? No. Yes. Yes. Finally, yeah. yes. Brenda, we missed you. So I wanted to ask you. Are you getting echo? You, no, nothing. No. You're sounding crisp. And I wanted to ask you, how did you enjoy the watch party? And also what you think about uh, the debate? Uh, I, I'm getting an echo on my end. But as long as you're not hearing it, that's OK. No, we're so, not hearing anything. Yeah. Um, so it went well. And um, 
it, it was enjoyable because of um it, it was just all word salad is really all all i heard and whenever he got asked tough questions by oz it was next yeah i mean i, I thought I, I was very um pleased with oz's performance i th think he did really well um it's a it's a lot better than being angry and confrontational you basically let them talk let them sink their own boat and then simply ask them to back up what they have to say and they can't do it yep and i made my you point know. i'm just quicker than he is mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I, I bet you we said the same amount of words too if you went back and like counted the words we both said <laughs> And I bet you when you when you count for like depth of content, like yeah. <laughs> Quicky says, uh, "I'm a heliosexual," according to Caleb. Yes, I've been called that too, and I have internalized it. And the same way I said to Witsit, "Don't call people degenerates." I'm a degenerate. I am now a degenerate heliosexual. So yeah, there we go. Yeah, <laughs> I I don't know what happened. I, everything was working fine. And, and then I, I shut off my mic for a long time listening party. And now everything's all effed up. I just, I'm, I'm uh, getting an uh, echo. Huh? It's the Jews. We all know that. <laughs> that came up at the end of the debate. That like, was crazy. <laughs> what, what came up? Uh, the whole the the people conspiracy thing about the education and they know Man everything. Alone. Yes. CIA did the JFK assassination or some. Does it make sense that it was the Irish mob? But whatever. <laughs> I'm the worst person to confront about standard education. Like, I did not like. I've said this story I think a hundred times. Like, they obviously know nothing about me i when i was in the third grade I, my teacher put me in my own little special corner and said here study all these books and i i was testing out of like high school in the third grade so i i i went to the fourth grade basically then i stopped going to school and then i got my ged i went to the ninth grade i got my ged and then i went to college like I did not have a public school education. I, I challenged out my two-year college degree by taking Clep and Dante exams, by studying what, nothing. I just took the tests and passed because 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 I've read thousands of science fiction books, <laughs> thousands and thousands. And I go in. They give me a test on. Um, um, social studies, like for six credits for college, and I pass. I take one on math. I pass. I, and then they say, "Here's your two-year degree in electromechanical engineering technologies." And then I get I get another twenty-five percent of my bachelor's degree, and then most of my bachelor's degree I do online or off campus. Like I am not the guy that went to public school his whole life, like they were. Anyway, so just saying. Uh, monkey, <clears throat> sorry, monkey cat pat pat says, uh, "Does Shane know what G means in the buoyancy equation?" He replaced it with A. Uh huh. Yeah, and then this is the guy that I was telling you about. TV. These two clowns are are doing all this. Uh, to explain a non-observed fact, there's no downward bias, clouds, guys. And everyone in the side chat tried to explain to him what the Cavendish and gravity, but he wasn't taking any of it. He was just like, nah, nah, nah. And then we have well, another message. Sorry, go ahead, Brenda. Well, clouds are affected by gravity. Nobody yes. thinks they're not. That's Rain. why it starts raining. A cloud isn't a thing. It's a cloud. And it's and just you get, a collection of water droplets. And you get and layers each individual of water cloud. droplet is carried aloft by upward rising warm air. And uh, you get layers of clouds when you go up on a plane. 
you get that one layer of clouds, you get another layer of clouds. That's also an indication of gravity. Why aren't they all at the same place? Obvious. Uh, Hensik asked, has Shane written a science paper that has been peer reviewed? And I don't think we can tell. By his own peers. <laughs> he By was, Dustin he, Nemos, he was surprised when you said that you uh, were reading his papers on, uh, on, on the channel. Yeah. I don't know if you caught that, but he was really surprised. But now you have a, a somewhere, he gave the URL where he has uh, all of this. Uh, now you have somewhere else where to take material from. Oh, I've been pulling it up. So I have his, his website. So I pulled it up on stream. So I don't know what else there is to learn. There's not much substance to the ether cosmology argument. And... Like, I can memorize, like, words, like, but why? As long as you understand the concepts, you can... This is the problem. If you can under... If you understand the concepts well, you can explain it in easy-to-understand terms. They don't do that. Why? Why do they memorize these words that are not easy to convey to their funny. audience? It's yeah. called draining epistemic authority. It's Can you hear me? I'm yeah. Sorry. I'm so excited. I figured it out. I figured it out. I figured it out. <laughs> it was on. I'm sorry. It, I was getting echo because uh, three levels deep in the sound app, it says, listen to this device. And it was clicked. Uh huh. And so oh. I was getting feedback. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I interrupted, but I was so excited. No, no, pro no problem. No problem. It's fine. Um, yeah, we were talking about that a little bit later. And I had a teacher that told me that understanding something is being able to explain it to someone who has less understanding than you. And therefore, that is considered. Someone has some background noise. I think it may be Tyler, but it's a call. Right, well, yeah. I used to get accused of doing that in school, like or in like tech school and the Navy and stuff like that. The instructors in the class, some of the instructors would get mad at me because I would like take what they said. Like some guy next to me would listen to the lecture in, in the Navy. He'd ask me a question and I, I knew the answer, but like he knew I could answer him. He couldn't understand the teacher, the instructor. So he asked me, what did he just, what was he talking about? He knew I could explain it to him where he could understand it. So what do I do? Do I just explain it to him? No, 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 no. Because I realize if he doesn't understand it, there's probably a lot of people in the class that don't understand it. So I asked the instructor, I, I asked, hey, when you explain this concept, do you actually, is this what you mean by this concept? And they would get mad at me for like reframing their concepts to be more easy to, for easier to understand for the rest of the class. I did the same thing when I was in school. I, I used to reteach yeah. the, the the lesson out happened like a yeah. cigarette. Break. I used to smoke back then. And then I actually tried to help the class because the one teacher and, and I, I swear to this day, he would teach to fail the class because he, he <laughs> wanted a high failure rate so that he can claim that it was the most difficult course that the college offered. And like he would, he would explain timing diagrams and he would say, oh, it's simple. You just read it from right to left. And I would like, no, you read it from left to right. Like, obviously, like, is he saying that because he's trying to catch the people who are paying attention and he wants to be corrected? And so when I raised my hand and I said, you just read it right to left, don't you mean left to right? And he was like, no, it's right to left. And, and like, I, I had so many like hair pull out moments and I, and there was a couple of lectures I got up and just walked out and people would ask me why. And, and I would explain it to them. And then they would say, you know, Tyler, you were right because we did that last exam and I read it from right to left, you know, a on B off and stuff like that. And I got it all wrong. Like when they handed it back, I said, yeah, he is teaching to fail. He wants a high failure rate so that he can claim that this course is more difficult than the other courses. Like he's a bad teacher. We have a question uh, from Sydney Raptor. 
If lightning is static discharge, is that why dark clouds stay up? Dark matter discharge. <laughs> well, uh, we covered the, the dark matter, uh, the Gupta, uh, a little bit after you left uh, in the after show. And it seems to be getting a lot of traction these days, uh, this Gupta paper. And uh, we'll see what happens. And we, we yeah. also covered that uh, uh, we are science as a whole is open to changing their minds and moving on to a new paradigm. So that that's... I read it today. I read the paper today before the debate, too, just in case it came up. Just uh -huh. in case dark matter and dark energy came up to talk about. And it's not um, the CCC cosmological model. It's um, coupling capacity or coupling. Um, I wrote it down a little bit. But the CCC entire light, it's is to say the cosmological. It's replacing the cosmological constant with CCC, with mm -hmm. the covariant constant. So it's saying the cosmological constant is changing too. Huh. Huh. Yeah, but well, it, it's it's dangerous to jump on bandwagons too early. I mean, yeah. let the I, I my I would let the physicists figure it out first before. Yes, because you know it, it's like when I remember that time when when what was some Italian lab said that they caught neutrinos oh. traveling faster than light, and I was like, holy shit, this is all new. This changes everything this is all brand new physics and then some months later it was uh there was a loose cable yeah so you know you never know it, it's a cosmological constant is replaced with the covariant coupling constant yeah yeah brenda i'm not saying it's true i'm just saying whenever they appeal to papers like well dark energy and dark matter it's like well why don't you appeal to this paper that that, that doesn't include dark energy, dark matter. Why is your preference for ether papers versus this paper? All oh, because it says the universe is 26 billion years old and you don't like that? Like, that's yeah, why, and, right? And the reason I brought it up is because I saw uh, Dr. Becky, who has a astrophysicist, has a YouTube channel, really awesome channel. And uh, she mentioned it last year when the paper came out. Mm -hmm. But now I'm starting to see it more and more come up in the physics channels and in the science channels. So I'm seeing it getting more and more traction. Uh, I still say that we still have to see what comes out of this, but I'm acknowledging that this paper from Gupta is getting a lot more traction in, at least in the media world surrounding science. What tells us uh, Feynman's way to improve knowledge by learning to teach it to a child? Yes, and they appeal to uh, those lectures a lot. And all this clip from today, which uh, was pretty awesome, uh, I hadn't seen that one before, but that one was appealing to Cavendish, to balls, and to gravity, and to the globe. So the, they have a hard time <laughs> reconciling everything because they appeal to Feynman, but oh no, in that, in that he was just crazy. <laughs> Uh, I do that on purpose to create some cognitive dissonance in their worldview. Like, yeah, yeah. reminder move. <laughs> I think one of the things is, is the difference is, um, and it's not just flat earthers; it's also creationists. Um, they want certainty. They don't like it when science changes. Flat earthers don't like it that um, we have had different values for the distance to the sun. Oh yeah, right. They don't like that, and and you know, creationists will make similar statements. If, if they want, they want the comfort of, of certainty and um, they need to learn the, the pleasure of not knowing, I think. And there's Leo. Leo, hey. I wanted to add to the particular point that's being made here about cherry picking in science, cherry picking, you know, the kind of science that supports conclusions already held and liking it simply uh -huh. because it's contrarian to the mainstream. And I, I haven't seen it yet. I don't know if it's gotten around to some of these circles, but I'm expecting within the next couple of weeks to couple months within creationist and 
probably flat earth circles on the internet to start going, oh, well, but have you seen the new Desi results? Uh, they're showing that dark matter might not be constant. See, your model's falling apart. <laughs> Which is funny because cosmologists never claimed that we knew that dark energy was constant over time. That's just what we have observed thus far. We have not yet found any observations that hint at uh, variance in the density of dark energy over time. We've got some preliminary results that do seem to suggest that, but we won't really know until the full survey and examining all of the data and everything is complete in like two or three years or something like that. Mm -hmm. Hey, Leo, do you remember, like it might have been a few, maybe even a decade ago, when physicists were talking about the end of physics, that there's no more physics to be done. Um, uh, it, it's, it's virtually complete. We've just got a few ends to tidy up. Do you remember that? Yeah, that was kind of a somewhat, I, yeah. I wouldn't say yeah. it was a popular opinion in physics, but you certainly it was, had your physicists that were out there sort yeah. of making that claim that we'll get you know quantum gravity tied up and then that'll pretty much be it. Yeah. And it's and like, no. Then we get a new, a new instrument. This always happens. You get You're new smart. instruments and they make new observations and it throws everything um, into question, right? Yep. So, you, you know, there's but a lot of But that's what things. science should do. <laughs> yes. You know, I used to work at a, um, a medical clinic and when they got new um, scanning technology 3d tanning scanning technology for the human body they discovered new tissues and new structures in the human body that that didn't get seen um for for various reasons from other reasons from x-rays or from uh um, um autopsies um and you know it, it new technology almost always leads to new science yeah, no, ah. that, that and that's exactly the thing is we develop some sort of technology, we make observations using the technology, and it helps us sort of develop our theories. And then we find questions that we can't, this technology, we're really struggling to push it to answer these questions. So, you know, the best idea is probably X, and then we get better technology, we run those experiments we couldn't previously run, and we find out, oh, nope, it was actually Y. Okay, that's exactly what science is supposed to do. Yeah, but then see what happens. You get certain personalities, the, the the very, very, very conservative personalities who say, "Oh my, oh nothing matters. Nothing matters. I I feel we're floating in uncertainty. I can't handle." You're this. changing your mind all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yep. yep. And I think it's just a personality that is just uncomfortable with 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 levels of uncertainty. Change. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm not talking of... about. I'm not talking about you know strictly political conservatives. I I, I could get along with you know, well, yeah, I'm like talking people about with people conservative are... mindset in physics. Like I'm actually yeah. relatively conservative in my mindset in physics. I doubt that string theory is true. I doubt that loop quantum gravity is true. Um, you know, I personally don't think that gravitons are real because I don't think gravity is a fundamental force. I think gravity probably like space time emerges. So I could be very wrong about that. So I, I am actually quite conservative in terms of physics. I don't, I, I guess there's a limit to the weirdness I think that reality has, but <laughs> God, we've been surprised so many fucking times. Who knows at this point? Yes. That, did, did you, you hear my, watch? did you hear, did you watch the debate, Leo? I actually did not. I was watching uh, okay. the Curse of Oak Island when it started, unfortunately. That's fine. So, like, my oh. argument, they, like, toward one of the Super Chat questions, I think it was, I, I took the time of answering, or maybe it was And just really quickly, questions. was the debate specifically on Aether Cosmology? Was that the topic? It, it was on um, what was gravity, um, electrostatics, oh. or um, mass attracts mass. Mm -hmm. um, what best explains it, so... Well, I'm um, definitely going to go back and watch that then. Well, uh, you'll need a yeah. lot of dressing. You'll need a lot of dressing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, just, I, I just want to – I'm really interested because I, I, I have a feeling I know what Oz is going to say. You know, He's going to say something along the lines that I would about you know the differences between the two and how each one can't really account for the other. And th these are going to cause problems. But uh, I'm really curious just to see how Jaren spins this. <laughs> well, it's not Jaren. It's Shane. Uh, I debated oh, Shane okay. St. Pierre. Jaron was actually on decent. Jaronism. Oh, I see. Jaron, Jaron tried to rescue Shane a couple of times, but it really, he was really, all in all, I'd say he was very fair. 
I have really? heard that he's actually a pretty decent moderator. It was I, I it so. was Shane's first debate, and I. So to be fair, I was cherry. gaming you, it. You popped his cherry, Oz. <laughs> I was gaming the 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 platform, and I even tried to say, "Let me speak more because I'm gaming it too much. You're wasting too much of your time, Shane. Let me see. Let me start talking more." Um, but no, like in the, I said, my worldview is not heliocentrism. My worldview is not globe. My worldview is that all causal events are best explained by natural causes. And to, to change my worldview, well, you have to show me that there's a supernatural cause. But I would just say that if you showed me something supernatural, I would just say it must have a natural explanation that these type of things aren't going to actually ever change my fundamental worldview. So like to to change something about science is not so these concepts like oh things are changing too much like if something changed about evolution it wouldn't be a radical shift in my worldview because my grounding for my worldview is not based upon our current understanding of evolution it's not my based on might change drastically because of the desi results and thinking yeah. that dark energy might actually vary with time that's that's really interesting hey shane i don't change I don't here wanna or anything but i'm gonna go because it's really late time flies when you're with friends you're all excellent and awesome wow. and i had a great here. evening but i wish you all a nighty night and i gotta go take to care bed. have a good night take it easy to, uh, uh, what sent us a, a, an awesome message with a really nice beautiful message uh if you can give the law of learning to a child you have done your job as a teacher thank you for that uh what it's awesome i have a question uh, sentiment and i agree Yes, go um, ahead. So, and this is one of the questions I love to ask about this particular subject. Did you ask Shane at all to give the equations of motion for how electrostatics um, attracts massive bodies, why it's proportionate to the mass of the bodies, and the square of the distance between them? What are the equations of motion that explain this? Write out for me, mathematically, right now, the equations of motion for a one kilogram ball falling yes. on earth, barring resistance from 1000 kilometers up. Just yeah, we write spent, out the equations of motion. And they can't ever do it naturally. We spent a lot of time talking about it. He showed the kinematic equation. Shane's in the audience too. He could come up and talk about it. He spent a lot of time showing the kinematic equations for buoyancy and he accepts the 9.8 meters per second square for the downward acceleration. Um, but he just calls it A instead of G, and he showed Coulomb's law, which is deals with electric charges. But I'm like, well, if we're dealing with electric charges, that's that deals with the electric charge of the object, not the mass of the object. I'm like, I didn't see like after she, if, then they said, well, the steel man Shane's view, it just deals with the the downward bias. Um, and like then. You should have a polarity in all your formulas because we should be able to flip the downward bias and there should be a polarity symbol based on the electrostatic charge in the atmosphere to explain the direction. Yeah. It, and mean, it's not the, there in your equations. From just these two comments here in the chat, it seems that all he's doing is sort of claiming that, well, because you have F equals G, uh, uh, yeah, F equals G M1 M2 over R squared for gravity, and you have F equals K Q1 Q2 over R squared for electromagnetism or electricity, then they must be the same thing. No, they both just obey an inverse square law. That doesn't yes. make them the same inverse square law. And again, as I – Max, did you just say it? Maybe Oz said it? What? The, these things apply based on the charge of the object, not the mass. Yeah, Whether you mean. think gravity is whatever Einstein or Newton said it is or not, we know that gravity is related to mass. That much we can measure. So you have to explain why the attraction is proportionate to the masses of the bodies over the distance squared, not the charges. That's a different property. Yeah, you can use a scale to determine that. Uh, that it is related to the mass, not the electric charge. So then you're yeah. you're going to see it's it's based on just it's just the electric charge is 
determine the the direction, then don't appeal to Kulam's law. Like a Kulam's law would have nothing to do with it then. Like um I I you go watch the debate. I think I do cover that. Uh, I press them on that quite a bit. Good. And you can watch it on, on Jaren's channel or you can watch the watch party that we did here. It was very fun. Oh, you guys did a watch party for it? Yes. Yeah. Fuck yeah. Damn, I wish... Well, I, I would have showed up because I would have known about it if I wasn't watching my TV show. I'm sorry, guys. But <laughs> you know what, it's Leo? <laughs> everybody, else, everybody else streams their own debates on their own YouTube channel except me. So yes. I said, we're going to stream my debates at least here. So... Yeah, I don't Dang stream it. my own debates. I'm, I don't know why. I just don't. What, what's the show yeah. that you're watching? The Curse of Oak Island. Oh. I don't know. I thought maybe yeah. it something like familiar three body with problem. that one. Three Body Problem. Or oh, I you watched sh- that one. That's really fun. Shane, you should debate Leo. Leo's Leo knows much more about the physics than I do. Oh. Oh, Brenda's here. I'm out. Bye bye. Yeah. Oh. Um, oh. <laughs> I get bye that bye. a lot. I get Brenda's that a lot scared. because um, because of the bigotry and, and the trans hate on that side. You know, so just nice way to show yourself as a bigot, Shane. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Caleb came in today. He got shut down really fast. And he Caleb came up on stage. No, not on stage. Oh, he came the on chat. the side chat, and I just was, wasn't having any of it, and uh, he went he away. He came to pick up me on my Twitch. Like, his yeah. first comment was about my Twitch. Is that, Caleb, like, if you're watching this, I will debate your nonsense position. He People will say he's, like, the second, wor- second best Flat Earth debater. Hey, he's, Shane, Shane, if you're won? still there. No, Caleb. Shane, if you're still there, you're much better at debating than Caleb. Hands down, yes. bar none, oh, much absolutely. better than the Caleb. Uh, oh, I was absolutely. watching uh, Caleb against FTFE on Jaronism, and Caleb's whole presentation is Witsit's presentation. He has it slide oh. for slide. Yes, I swear to God. Yes. He, take the, he took the presentation, and I was looking at it. I've seen this before. And yeah, <laughs> he, has, he has screenshots of Witsit's presentation. Yeah. It's insane uh bogan <laughs> wait where was that comment hold on i have to read that one yes uh there's a lot of success in the heliosexual model hell yeah do you know what about the the heliosexual what? model heliosexual? now sexual yes yeah, so yes. stupid <laughs> so i, yeah, I wanted to bring this so hot yeah I wanted to bring this up too. I had it ready, but I, I didn't cover it because you know we can only cover so many topics. But um, with the with the globe, right? The um, oh shoot, never mind. So the angle, like where we go from 180 degrees. I can't remember the geometrical things, but the flat Earth is actually it's night 23.4 minus 90 degrees which is 66.36 degrees so it's a flat earth is actually satanic yes yeah with their hey, ether hey, model hey. their ether hey. rotation to explain the segnec <laughs> effect i their swear ether rotation. That they put words together ether rotation well they 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 that's their some of them do this, like that's what they're saying. Oh, you, you think know, it's ether dude. displace? You think it's ether rotation? I'm sorry, it's actually um quantum displacement. The quantum displacement of the strings in the loops, and then how, that's yeah, how sure. that's that's how gravity works. You know, that's I even said like, okay, so if you think that there needs to be a medium for EMF to travel through, or not EMF, uh, uh, um, yeah, EMF, electromagnetic fields. I keep on thinking electromagnetic force, but whatever, EMF. Um, to travel, th- then it's a vacuum. Just to peel the vacuum. They re- reify the vacuum as the ether if you really want to. <laughs> like, whatever, dude. Like, you, you don't need... And then I showed the video from Nathan Oakley about um, quantized light. <laughs> that was that was excellent. Uh, that was a great... I, that was, yes, like French kiss... You know, yeah, yeah, that was really good using um, the sun winked at us yesterday. Uh, yeah, j- just it, it's chef kiss, French kiss is kissing with tongues. Well, well, that's because... because I'm heliosexual and, yes. and I just can't help myself. 
It's I, good I, because I I'm appealing to I'm a, another flat earther to show that these flat earthers accept that light can be quantized. Well, you don't I have to reject do. it. No, but the ether model people reject it. Because, yeah, they, they yeah, don't. There's, it, go ahead, Brenda. There's history between um, yeah. John Stupa, uh, a quantum eraser, and the Electric Universe people. And he, oh, God. he says that light is just a particle, and he totally rejects the wave theory. Oh. Which is funny because oh. it's actually That's true that particles are always waves. They're never actually particles. It's just that we can reduce the waviness down to the point where we can sort of center it around the singular value in like simplistic terms. But it's always a wave. I... I asked him how we can measure like the 12.36 microseconds for the radar range model. Anyways, that's the speed of light. To go one nautical mile and return one nautical mile is 12.36 microseconds. That's what it is. Okay, microseconds. Really At that. first I thought you said seconds. I was going to say, well, that oh, microseconds work because it's only seven seconds to get around the whole planet one yeah. time. In, or okay. um, Earth seven times the around sun. the planet in one second. But yeah, yeah. microseconds. Okay. I'm okay. You. So going with that, he says it's something that the perception of the EMF is induced and has a leg, but light itself travels instantaneously. I'm like, what is EMF if it's not light? Like you, you're like, so you're you're appealing to concepts that you have, don't know if they exist. I I should I the format didn't allow me to press them right away on this because I'm muted half the time. Because it's a it's forty five minutes each, and Did I I got cheated on eight minutes. But you, you, you could you use the buzzer though. That's why that like you could. That's I didn't the, use the buzzer. Do they understand that? Do they understand that, 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 they understand that radio I, is? Do they understand that radio waves are light? That EMF is light. Do they understand that? Yeah, but he's seeing the and he's seeing the it's the EMF is induced and that lags the light. E that light what? propagates through the ether infant it, it instantaneously, but the EMF is induced. They like they're two different concepts to him. That's my steel man. You go watch it. I need to like wait, you know what we need to do tomorrow is a debate review. Like mm -hmm. tomorrow. I think at five o'clock I need to do a debate review so can I can I figure out I would love to be a part yes, of that. Yes. Five what time do you want to do it tomorrow? If you said you said five o'clock, yeah, five p.m. is normally when I do five p.m. Eastern. Normally, yeah, I I could do that. Okay, five p.m. Eastern tomorrow. We'll do the that's debate 4 review. For me, so that works. Yeah. What was I going to okay. say? Oh, yeah, the ether. It, it but, but part of the reason why the ether was posited was number one, we needed a medium for light to travel. But we kind of figured out that light does, in fact, have a finite speed, which would be expected if there were this ether this mechanical ether that it had to travel through it would have a finite speed probably a finite maximum speed through that ether when there's nothing else but the ether the ether version of at vacuum so to speak um so yeah. instantaneous travel with an ether i mean in principle it can work but th th that seems a little weird me, well, I he's guess. he's appealing to like the EMF being induced, and that travels at the speed of light, the EMF. But maybe he's saying that light is ether. I, I, I have to slow it down, like, and listen to what he says to understand it, and then it's you can shame, go debate right? him. Yeah, Shane. I am SRV says I'm back one uh, on this side. We would say no us, one. but. Uh... Well, yeah, you say, you always say that, so that's why I'm I am answering the question. <laughs> I I enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, it was so. fun. It was fun, but uh, he always says that debates are not about winning or losing, and that's a fair position. I'm more of a simple-minded person, so I would say I I always like to. Sometimes I can't. I remember a couple of debates ago. I couldn't tell who was the winner because I, I I got lost. <laughs> uh, I, I think times. I think if I had it narrowed down, I think I made my arguments were easier to understand because I couldn't understand everything he was saying. 
But some people think if people use intellectual words, even if they don't understand what they mean, that means the argument is intellectual. Mm -hmm. But just because people use complicated words doesn't mean the argument is coherent. Yeah, That's correct. Guys, so, these terms, it, it's these, a very tricky line to get right, a balance between actually yeah. explaining yourself uh, with the correct language and uh, not making it so complicated so that no one understands you. It's a very tricky thing to do. But uh, it was I could follow uh, a lot of what what I got lost in some parts, but I could follow a lot of what he was saying. So uh, we we have commended him on the beginning of the show that it was a good cordial debate, and we that's what we want to see. We want to see more of that. Somebody commented and tagged me on Twitter. Ozian, if Grout, someone actually paid five dollars to ask me this. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that uh, on uh, uh, Kango 44, he get, he had some amazing questions today. He always has good questions for the, the flatter side, but today he was savage. I think I, I answered two ways. I think um, gravity is a property of mass and the earth is not in free fall around. The sun is, is traveling in a, in a straight line in non-Euclidean space. Yes. In in a um no in non-Euclidean space in I used the correct language though in yes, uh, yes, you did. In what in do they that, call it? I don't remember the word exactly. I used I the right word the though, I think. Word. Yes. The right word I for can't what? Remember. Um when you're talking about like a straight line with um Oh, a geodesic? Yes, yeah, well, that. I didn't say geo. I may have said geodesic, but I think I yes. said the radi, not a radiator, but the what the hell's the word? It doesn't matter. Yeah. Electro neutrino. Who gave us rotator? A, a really? No, no, no. Uh, he gave us a bunch of really funny jokes during the watch party. Says using big words to sound more photosynthesis. <laughs> I probably said the wrong thing, Leo. You can fix me in the in no. The it's I'm here. just trying to figure out what what you were referring to with the term that we're offering. Not domain, but um, um, so like around a curve between any any two points that are adjacent to each other is a straight line. What's that called? Well, I would call the. I'm pretty sure that's like on a surface of a sphere. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that a geodesic? Is the straight is the straightest line between two points in a curve? Yeah, it's yeah, no, it's, it's, it's called something I think else. Geodetic was the word that you used in the debate, no. but I it's use okay. <laughs> you're so happy to, to use it. complex you're going language. To you try forget to what I know. Right My brain, but I, I know <laughs> the word, I just can't recall it. You'll, we'll hear it yeah. in the review. It's um, not like it's I read it off of being something. What what happened? Could you get your your uh, PowerPoint up and running? I don't think so, right? What, uh, the was it crashed? Okay, the problem is my PowerPoint, when I press play, it fills my screen, and Zoom fills the same monitor. So, like, I have to alt-tab between the two and then go back to share. So, like, I need to fix it so my PowerPoint doesn't do that. So mm -hmm. that was what the problem was. <laughs> Uh, because of Zoom and my PowerPoint. Oh, Ooh, new member. We have a new member, Research Cube Earth. Yes. Uh, <laughs> thank you for becoming why, a member. Why is nobody getting in with me, with the Conical Earth team? Come on now. Conical oh, Earth. It's great. No, I am Inverted Donut Earth. <laughs> um, Leo, Con Conical Universe is where the Coneheads came from. Yeah, yes. Exactly. <laughs> Ah, uh, we we could make uh, some of these like weird debates. And so you arguing for the conical earth, me arguing for the inverted donut earth, and some weirdness like that. That might be fun. But something actually thinking about this just popped into my head. With excuse me, with respect to the, the whole um, gravity versus electrostatics is what I want to know is I want to ask somebody like Witsit or Shane, are the effects if like 
essentially the same. You're just attributing it to a different force. And I would imagine they would say yes. And I would just respond with then, you do realize that means that you still get the hydrostatic equilibrium regardless of wh what force is causing it then. And so the earth will like, like, this is not getting you out of the problem. You think that it's getting you out, of, <laughs> which is yeah. the only reason you're trying to run away from general relativity in the first place. Like what, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Oz brought that up today. <laughs> oh, good. Good. Yeah. Really I, well, I didn't good. say it in that language, but I said, if you're appealing to this, this force of electrostatics to cause this, this equilibrium, like, you know, like you would still create a sphere. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Like, like the hydrostatic so, and, equilibrium is still there. Like you didn't get rid of that. Yeah, you would still have space, orbits, all this other stuff. He kept every time I kept talking about the Cavendish experience experiment, <laughs> he would change the subject to um um orbital mechanics every single time. <laughs> like, like you're right, Cavendish experiment was about measuring the mass of the earth. But it still gives us the gravitational constant too. Like it, it gives us the the gravitational force between two masses. Also, like we can use it to give us two different things: um, the the gravitational force between two masses and the gravitational constant, and we can use it to measure the mass of the Earth. Mm -hmm. There, like all yeah. three things. I don't have to appeal to um, orbital mechanics, like. That's where Newton came up with the thing was it was for, through orbital mechanics. What whatever it, I can't remember the guy's name now. I, I liked how you explained. I liked how you explained yeah. how you changed the variables, and, and that's oh, yeah. also this because that's the big one of the things they they recite quantum eraser with his uh, absurd um, science restrictions that you have to have variables and you have to manipulate them, but the same is true. With, the same is true with elect, electromagnetism. When when you have a, a motor or a generator, you're you're cha you're not changing the charge, right? The charge yeah. is constant, right? You're altering you're you're altering the the motion of the magnet through the electrical field or whatever it is you're doing, right? I'm having yeah. that right, don't I? Yeah, yeah. we can well, measure all these sure. things. Which so which impress me. Are. Went to try to catch me twice on that, and I had like, nope, you're not catching me this on the Cavendish experiment. You can't manipulate it to measure gravity. You want to bet? I can change the, the size of the masses to measure to to manipulate the force of gravity, the gravity, mm -hmm. and, and to calculate the gravitational constant, which they've done. Uh, which they've something... done. Uh, something came up. Mash 333, having this experience live now at the Wayne Casino. Really? That was that was fun. That when when Shane brought up that why don't they build like a Disney ride of the Cavendish Oh experience? Yes. I was like, what? Do you think it's what are what are they expecting it to do exactly? I we don't know, but uh, that that came up during the debate. They think like you should be able to prove mass attracts mass besides with the Cavendish experiment. And I remember Craig brought up in my debate I did with him about um, a pendulum next to some mountain in Asia somewhere that the pendulum swings with more force when it's next to the mountain because of the shape of the mountain. But I think the mountain is called Schellenberg or is it Sch yeah. something like that. Mm -hmm. SCH, there's an SCH. Oh, there. Oh, fuck. Yes. <laughs> Tim Bob's a wonderful guy. Please keep uh, your hands and feet inside the right at all times. Black. Well, there goes little Timmy. Uh, flat soil's objection to that, uh, to that plum with the mountain thing. I tried to explain that on SSUM's stream one time, and they were having none oh. of it. But his explanation was that it was the wind blowing the plum towards the, the mountain. Was, yes, he oh. did say that. That was fabulous. He said that. That was wild. But you can control for the wind. You can yes. encase it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you still get wind inside the case somehow. No, you don't. Aether wind. <laughs> yeah, you do. It's aether wind. The aether. Yeah, it was always but aether he wind. doesn't. 
He doesn't believe in the ether. Or yeah, so he no, said. We're, we're just being silly. Space wind. It's the wind intrinsic to space. We call that dark Somebody wind. Farted. Yes, it's dark wind. No one can see it. Yeah, it's a and did you guys know that experiment. The, that the strength of dark wind might not be constant over time. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. Yes. <laughs> I'm okay. Oh, oh. And that's what I try to see. I'm okay. Like, I'm not appealing to relativity because I can't do that test, but you can do the Cavendish. You can show mass attracts mass. Uh, so. Only the Germans would name a mountain Shehelion. <laughs> Wait, I don't even know what it means. Uh, it also came up that, uh, and you didn't press on it because it's not really that big, but it came up during the debate that they don't do the Cavendish experiment which they do, they do it a lot. And Brenda brought up that it's done on every physics class in college. So, yeah, there. I, I went through to a, um, a science laboratory supply company once for that gives it. It has lots of equipment for um, uh, high school and university classes, and you can literally buy a Cavendish experiment. It was like three grand. But you can buy one. But I was looking at that, thinking, you know, there's there's other things that were were much cheaper that I was thinking of getting, but I I never oh, did. Oh, if I had three grand. <laughs> so yeah. they, uh, they had to I, account for the curvature of the Earth and the rotation of the Earth, the latitude, to be able to to determine the gravity of the the mountain. Yeah. So uh, if you want wow. us to buy that uh, Cavendish experiment, start sending super chats. We need to yes, get we, we need a crowdfund for a Cavendish yes. experiment for three thousand dollars. <laughs> uh, there's no reason to do it though. Like it's it's like been done. But to then death. we get to tell people that we have a Cavendish experiment. True. Who is yeah. the guy? There was somebody in one of the discords, uh, the Globe Earth Discord. <clears throat> excuse me, who used. Two frozen turkeys and some chicken nuggets. Mm -hmm. Wow. Who I forget what his name was, but I, I've well, been laughing all night. My jaw is starting to hurt at this point because I've tried, been giggling and laughing. He tried so to appeal it to electromagnetism, electrostatics for the Cavendish experiment. It's like, well, then you should test that. But you appeal to Feynman lectures about electrostatics. They're all going to be equal potential because they're all connected together. And and even so, electrostatics is like like charges repel. So if anything, they should have a like charge and be repelling, not attracting. Like they, and we're showing an attractive force, not a repelling force. So it's so silly. And, like, and some of the Cavendish are made inside a Faraday cage and with everything grounded. Yeah. So like the pot the electric potential is minimum. Use all conductive material, then it won't be effective at all because it'll all be the same general uh, potential charge. Chicken and a Cavendish. Yeah. Uh, the audience, everyone has been great tonight. Thank you for, for joining us. It, it's been uh, a true pleasure to do the watch parties. We might do some more because I had an awesome time. Yeah. I don't know I if we should fun. do... Yeah, I think MVP it's fun to just explain how fun. flat Earth math just does not work at all. Yeah, but debate review tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Be here for that. We'll do a debate review of the debate I just did, so we can break down the words. Because sometimes he, he maybe he said <laughs> something that's smart and that needs to be evaluated. Yeah, definitely. Was Shane pretty respectful in the debate? Sounds like it. Shane. Yeah, yeah, he yeah, was a was. great guy. Everyone, mm -hmm. everyone was awesome. Yeah, it was. It didn't get bad. It was just, there was a lot of word salad. Oh, my God. A little bit, yeah. Uh, repeating, tomorrow... Repeating a lot of, of the same stuff, too. I felt like Shane was just repeating the same thing and not really getting anywhere. Yeah. Ah, uh, Victoria... Uh, says, forget the Cavendish experiment. For the same money, you can buy a gravimeter map it, and map your neighborhood. Sure. But I'm going to go to bed because it's late for me. Yes, uh, I, I think we're going to wrap it up uh, because I, my jaw hurts from all the laughing. And tomorrow, <laughs> be, uh, after Oz's show, 9 p.m., we're having the Tell Me That Story show. 
I haven't decided yet what I'm going to do. I still have to write the show, but I do think that we are going to talk about uh, a little bit about Hans Christian Andersen and the actual tales that he told, which are not the ones that most people know. So I'm thinking well, I'm going to go that way, but I still, I'm still not sure. But we will have a show tomorrow afternoon, nine, uh, tomorrow evening, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Oz, thank you so much. The watch party was awesome. The debate was also awesome. Brenda, Billy, Leo, thank you for being. Any Anything you would like to say before we wrap it up? Uh, uh, no, no. All right. Not, not everyone at once. Well, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate you. Thank you, everyone in the audience uh, for the support of the channel. Take care. Have a good night. And us, you did great. We'll catch you back tomorrow, 5 p.m. and 9 p.m. for our regular shows. Goodbye. Thanks.